pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. Well, thank you for joining us. I'll walk us quickly through our agenda, which is long, and um, then we will get right down to business. So first, um, we actually did open our meeting at 6.30. We had need of an executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining and also to um, review executive session minutes for the meetings of June 6th and August uh, 2017 and August 14, 2017. So we did have executive session. We've adjourned and reconvened in regular session. Um, so we will start our night, as we always love to do, with recognitions. That will be followed by our first opportunity for public comment. We'll have reports to the school committee, starting with student council. We then have um, Brian Burdick here to make a presentation to us regarding ClearGov. We'll have liaison reports. Um, I will have my school committee chair report. The superintendent will present her, re her report. And um, we'll have a report from the director of finance. After that, we will have our preliminary discussion of our capital requests for, two th for FY19. Um, under new business, we'll start with a vote on the ClearGov presentation to be followed by um, a discussion of school committee policy ILBA, pupil rights, EEAE bus safety, EEAEE -E -E, bus accidents, um, and a review of the campus road master plan design. Um, under old business, we will have another look at policy EBC safety and security. Um, as well as policy IJOA field trips and p policy JICFB subcommittee. Oh, that's our bullying policy. We have to vote on our subcommittee. Um, our last item under old business is an update regarding the superintendent's search as well as the appointment of the screening committee. Following that, we'll have our last opportunity for public comment, followed by items by consensus, and it is our goal to adjourn by 10.15. So last time we were early, we're gonna, that's going to be our new trend. So we're going to see if we can do that. So without further ado, um, I believe that we have someone here that we would like to invite up during our recognitions portion. So Mr. Kilduff, if you could join us. Um, while he's coming up here, I'll just, Nancy and I had the pleasure this weekend. You can join I'm us. I'm smiling. I'm not there. laughing. You're yeah. just, you just bring joy to the meeting every time. Always, always comes with a gift. Yep. Um, so Nancy and I had the pleasure on Sunday of going to an event that uh, Mr. Kilda facilitated with Catherine Switzer, who, for those of you who do not know Catherine Switzer, um, is the woman you can see pictured there in this beautiful um, framed series of photos who uh, was the first woman uh, to, to be seen to run the Boston Marathon. You can see her being pushed off the course by the course director. Um, so she last year ran Boston again. She's run it before, but ran it again, f celebrating 50 years since that event and sort of officially passing the torch to the next generation. So took the opportunity to come back to Hopkinton um, last weekend to thank Hopkinton for the welcome that she received in the spring and just was such an inspirational day and um, the conversation that she had with the students was really, really powerful, I thought, and really uh, motivating. And so just the opportunity to have such a a world-class um, athlete, advocate for for female athletes, for equal rights, for leadership, and, and just standing up for what you believe in. It was just really excellent. I thought it was really well done. And she gave us a gift. So we asked Mr. Kilduff to come and present that. So there you go. Thank you. Uh, you, I don't know if you recall, but last spring, uh, last year was Catherine's 50th anniversary of this historic run. One of the things that she did prior to the race was um, come to the high school and uh, D. King arranged for her to talk to the spring sports captains, male and female, uh, which was really terrific. She has a, a, the message that she has really resonates with the young men, uh, so it's terrific. But she was here Sunday because she wanted to thank the community for the support that they gave her last spring. Uh, she brought this with her and uh, and we gave it to Nancy and uh, Jean, uh, she did on, on Sunday for the for display in the high school. We're starting to build a little uh, quasi-museum here, which I'm really, really quite quite happy about. 
but uh, this is from Catherine. Um, she's running the New York Marathon. She's Catherine is 74. Um, she's she ran Boston last year. She's running New York Marathon in a couple weeks. She went out. And, those of you who know something about running. Uh, uh, she ran out. Uh, went out last week and did a training exercise. She ran. Uh, uh, she marked out a half a mile and ran 10 repeats, 10 half miles with a short rest in the middle at 74 years old. So I'd say that's pretty pretty cool. Uh, and then before I leave, uh, so this is from Catherine. Um, I just wanted to reiterate the excitement that's been generated by that cross country course. The middle school uh, athletes have used it. The thing that was stunning to me. Um, had an opportunity to attend the, the, the turf meeting, uh, the fields meeting last night. But one of the biggest arguments, I think, uh, for upgrading our facilities, when we were out there and we ran, they ran the, the, the cross country course, the middle school cross country course, there were hundreds, hundreds, and I'm not exaggerating, hundreds of people out there. Soccer, JV football, uh, cross country, and we were able to create the, the course that wove its way through all of those other athletes. And it's really, you know, it's, it's quite emotional to watch the soccer team stop and support, uh, support their fellow students. So it's, uh, it's a success. So thank you. And this is from Catherine. Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. And we'll get it. We promise we'll give it to Mr. Bishop. <laughs> I'll drive it there myself in my car. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, Tim. Um, okay, does anybody else have any other recognitions? Okay. So is anybody here for public comment? Deafening silence. Okay. So um, why don't we start with, well, we'll do the student council, and then they can go home and do their homework, and then we'll do Mr. Burdick. So come on up. We have Bridget Belger and Zach Sasitsky. Did I get you right? Because I knew I was going to confuse you with your siblings. So come on up, and um, that microphone is so that they can hear you on HCAM. We can hear you. Just go right ahead. Um, so we wanted to start off with our past <coughs> events from last week. So last Thursday night, we had International Night, and it was a raging success. Over 100 students attended and there was a lot of really good food and we learned a lot about where the international students came from, or come from, sorry, and it was it was a really good night. So. Yep, and uh, looking ahead, tomorrow is an early release um, and there's a big football game. The Hopkins football team is 6-0 and right now and they're playing rival Halston who's 5-1. and So this will be for the Tri-Valley League Championship. Oh wow. And um, the Hillers Grillers is a group of kids um, that I'm a part of that we go down to the field at around 5, 5.30 and grill up um, hamburgers and hot dogs for students to come with their friends before the football game and socialize. And that's been really successful in pulling students to the game and helping with school spirit. And also student council now um, relating to football is working on a Thanksgiving raffle. So Something that student council had done years ago was on Thanksgiving we would raffle off a parking spot and two seats where um, the winner would get hot chocolate and blankets. So we're going to bring that back this year um, as a fundraiser. And yeah. Um, so some other upcoming events we have is we have Senior Halloween, which is the Tuesday of Halloween. Um, so I know I'm really excited for it. We're getting our costumes ready. We have the um, senior breakfast and competition in the morning. Um, and then also on November 2nd, there's a school talent show that is being hosted by the class of 2020. So I think that there are some really good submissions for that too, so that's exciting. And we also have um, HHS Today. Uh, the film um, is now actually a class, so they're going to be making episodes every week. Um, the first episode was today, and it was really well done. So oh, cool. it's good to see. Can can people see that like on the website or yeah, like I think it's on HCAM's website. Okay. Oh, cool. And lastly, we wanted to mention that our Unite mentorship program last week, we had Natick students come to our school and observe our advisories because they're looking to implement something similar. So that's been really fun for the Unite program that um, another school is trying to copy what we do. Oh, that's, that's great. great. That's right. great. What do you what do you love about the way we do advisories here? 
Um, I think bringing the freshmen together is a good thing. I think yeah. a lot of times when freshmen come in, they're with their select group of friends, and yeah. it's, I think it's good for them to meet new people and socialize with a group that they can move up with throughout high school. Yeah, so that was great for you when you were a freshman too. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree. I think my advisory is a really mixed group of people that we wouldn't have been friends with if it weren't for advisory. So I think that that's really neat, the way that advisory brings each other together, and it's a safe place that everyone can express how they feel mm. and um, not feel like they're being criticized or anything. Mm -hmm. Nice. Thank you. Great. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Much. Have a great night. You too. You're more than welcome to stay. <laughs> okay, so let's invite up Mr. Burdick from ClearGov. Do you have everything you need technology-wise? He's all set. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, if I only had looked time, to so my right. I didn't right. want to turn my computer off in case. <laughs> <laughs> if I had only paid attention, Internet I would know. Internet and everything. Great. Well, welcome. Thank you. Um, I, I do want to say I think it's a little unfair that I have to follow a Hopkinton legend and the future of Hopkinton. Yeah. All at once. Usually people bring us gifts. So. <laughs> <laughs> You'll know for next time. No I pressure. I didn't know. <laughs> um, so thank you all for you know the opportunity to chat with you. I was able to get together with uh, Kathy and Jean a couple of weeks ago and kind of take them through what we're doing. Um, the, as, as a quick background, uh, ClearGov um, is actually headquartered here in Hopkinton. I happen to be a Hopkinton uh, resident. My co-founder also happens to live in Hopkinton. So a lot of connections to the community. Um, and, and our focus really is to help local governments, so towns, cities, school districts, uh, to help them operate and communicate more efficiently, more effectively. And we do that by providing a turnkey transparency and benchmarking solution. And I'm going to take you through, Kathy and, and Jean asked me to kind of take you guys through both pieces of that tonight. So I'll do that, you know, fairly quickly, but uh, happy to stick around and answer any questions uh, that, that you guys have. Fair enough? Yes. Great. So um, the way to think about ClearGov is, is we've actually gone out and aggregated data uh, from a variety of public sources. So from State Departments of Revenue, DESE, you know, Departments of Reven uh, Education in other states, Census Bureau, a whole bunch of different sources of public data, pulled that all together. And actually, uh, on the civic side, town side where we started, we've actually pre-built profiles on literally every town, city, village, borough in the entire country, about 36,000 of them so far. Um, on schools, we launched our school product back at the beginning of this year, really the tail end of last year, and so far we've done Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania, and Georgia, and we'll eventually roll out to all other 46 states. Um, so what that allows you to do is you can go into ClearGov and type in the name of any town, or in this case, uh, any school district in one of those four states, and so we'll put, put in Hopkins in here and pull up um, what we call a preview profile. And so the preview profile is kind of a one-page summary of your district, and you'll see that it's unclaimed, uh, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, the unclaimed profile, the preview profile, um, includes a high-level snapshot of students and, and basically teachers, um, a high-level financial overview, income and expenses, um, some expenditure for student analysis, capital outlay summary, uh, performance metrics, again, at a high level, and then state aid information. Um, and this is all sort of at a very high level. You can see there's, you know, uh, buttons here where we can drill down, uh, but on the preview profile, if I click that, it tells me, hey, you know, this profile is locked. Um, we do allow towns and schools to claim their profile for free, so there's sort of a free basic level of service that we offer. Um, the basic profile unlocks just that next layer of data um, and gives you, you know, a few bells and whistles, right? You can put your school logo up on the page and you can, you know, create one peer group and a couple of things, and you'll see some of that as we go through. Uh, but we let you do that for free. Um, our model then is really to provide a premium service, so I'm going to switch gears here and show you one of our customers. Is that spelling right? Yeah, Medfield. Uh, so Medfield is similar size, a little bit smaller than Hopkinton. Um, you can see, you know, they've got their logo here. Um, the, the preview page looks, you know, pretty similar. The first page, I should say, looks pretty similar. Uh, but now when I start to drill down into this data, so I want to look at 
uh, how Medfield's budget breaks down, I start to get a lot more detail. So I look at their overall education budget, see how it breaks down into you know, all of these categories. Um, I can look at this in a variety of different uh, visual formats, so bar charts, mountain charts, etc. All of our charts are interactive, uh, so if I click on you know, component here, I can turn on or off different elements to get instantly get a different view of the world. And then I've got the breakdown of these categories down below, instructional services, employee benefits, pupil services, etc. I can see how that, uh, how that data, how those uh, costs trend over time, year by year. And then most importantly, since we've gone out and aggregated all this information, we have the data on all you know, 404 districts in Massachusetts. That includes uh, charter schools, right? Um, since we have all that data, we can get this peer analysis as well. So if I click on view analysis, um, we see how Medfield, in this case, the yellow or orange line, whatever the color that is, uh, compares against a set of peers. Now, in this case, Medfield has actually set up their own custom peer group, which is something that we let our premier customers do. Um, we have a default uh, peer group as well that we offer as a part of the, the basic profile. Uh, that peer, uh, I'm sorry, that default peer group is kind of based on an algorithm that we've developed, number of students, medium household income in the town, a couple of other components. But at the end of the day, we know that, you know, you guys know who, your peers are better than we do, better than an algorithm can come up with. And so we let you create your own, right? And frankly, you can create as many as, as you want, and I'll show you a little bit more about that as well. So the peer group comparison shows, you know, how does Medfield compare against the other towns? I know that's a little hard, you know, to read from this distance, um, but they've got Weston, Wellesley, Dover, Sherburne, Wayland, Westwood, et cetera. Hopkinton actually is on there. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, I can see that as well on a statistically normalized bell curve to get a sense as to kind of how far from the mean they are. And then the raw data, of course, is, is down here. And this analysis exists for, if we go up and go uh, back a page to expenditures, um, this same comparative analysis exists for every one of these categories, right? So, you know, you can see in one instance they're spending 17% less, 35% uh, less in another. Um, and I can cont continue to drill down into this information. So how does instructional services break down by classroom and specialist teachers, other teaching services? Um, the level of breakdown that, you, that we can provide uh, really depends on what you guys want to do. We can go all the way down to the checkbook level detail if you want. Um, but that's totally up to you in terms of sort of how much detail you provide once you come on board. Um, it's not just financial information as well. So if we go back to here to kind of their homepage, um, it's also, you know, student body, employee breakdowns, as well as performance metrics. So you can see here, uh, again, we're looking at Medfield. You know, they've got a bunch of older students um, in, their, in their district, um, not as many kind of younger students coming through. Um, we've got a breakdown by high needs, uh, special needs students, which of course is a very important driver in a lot of costs um, in districts. Um, we can see that student population over time. And again, as I mentioned, all of these charts are interactive so you can get different views of the world. Um, student diversity information as well. Um, and then I mentioned metrics. So if I go back to the homepage one more time and drill down into the performance metrics, <coughs> Excuse me. Um, this is going to uh, bring up an overview of the PPI index, um, Progress and Performance Index, um, how that trends over time for Medfield, um, as well as graduation analysis, again, with all sorts of you know, interactivity here, um, and then MCAS and, and SAT scores, right? So it's MCAS in Massachusetts, in New York, it's Regents in you know, Pennsylvania, it's PSSAs. That varies a little bit from state to state. So let me stop there and just ask if there are any kind of clarifying questions on the transparency piece of this. Does that all kind of make sense to everybody? So this information, once Medfield becomes a subscriber, anyone can see what we're seeing right now? That's right. So okay. all, everything you've seen so far is, is publicly available, okay. right? And in fact, I'll show you really quick, um, just because I know they have the right on their page, Amesbury 
schools. There is a layer, though, Jen, that they that only administration can see right. as well. What Brian's showing. I'm going to show. I'm going to show. We haven't gotten next. to that yet. Okay. Yeah. Okay. This is just an example. So Amesbury Public Schools, also one of our customers. So they've put this, you know, uh, button on their homepage, right? That says Transparency Center. If I click that, it takes them directly off to uh, the ClearGov profile, right? But you can also go to cleargov.com. I mean, you can go there right now and look up any of these schools, any of these towns that we have profiles on. Make sense? So, so when you say, oh, sorry. No, yeah. go ahead. No, go ahead. So, uh, is the, the follow on to that is so I'm gathering if this is all publicly available information. So, this is a, if we subscribe, there's no additional work that's put on the administrative staff in terms of information provision on a regular basis, or you're, at, you're scraping it all from other places? Um, the short answer is yes. There is there's not nothing additional, or maybe no. There's nothing additional. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, there you'll see when I go into uh, the back end here that there are some things that you can do. You can add some context. You you can do some different things, but none of that's required. Okay. Right. And it's it's all very simple. You'll see in a second. Okay. Yeah. But it's it's all there. We actually. Um, you know, get this information directly from the your your desi reports that you file, and and the real value here is you know the average citizen. I mean, you guys know better than anybody how complex government finance is, right? Um, the average citizen can't sort out you know multiple funds in a spreadsheet and follow all the numbers. So we've taken all that and put it into this infographic format in a way that everybody can understand, right? So what you. Uh offering here is the analytics part of it? So it's it's the transparency, it's the comparative analysis, that context is really, really important. Um, you know, when, when somebody looks at a number, right, it says Hopkinton is spending $50 million a year on schools, on education, okay, is that a big number? Is that a little number? Is that a good number? Is that a bad number? There's no, con there's not a, no context there they leap to, you know, whatever conclusion they want, right? So that context, that understanding, that comparative analysis is really kind of the value that comes out of the, the transparency piece. I see. Right? You also talked about, you know, uh, more communication or facilitates communication between the town. Yep. Uh, overall, can you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, so let me show you one other quick one here. Um, and, oops. Um, I'm going to actually show you one of our town profiles, so just because I think they've done a really nice job with this. So Sudbury, Massachusetts, actually both town and schools are customers. Um, so as I mentioned, a lot of this is about providing the right context, sort of telling the story in the right way. So Sudbury's town profile, you'll see here one of the features that we offer in the premium profile, and I know you can't read that from here, but Melissa Rodriguez is the town manager. She's done a really nice job of utilizing the commentary feature to go in and, and provide some context behind the numbers, right? Telling the story behind the numbers. You know, so for example, here under employee benefits, she's saying, unlike many communities, Sudbury's employee benefits costs have decreased due to joining the GIC, blah, 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 right? Um, another example that might strike a little closer to home, you know, town takes on a big amount of debt. Maybe you're building a new school, let's say. <laughs> Um, you could add some commentary that reminds people, hey, you know, we increased debt three times, but remember, we're using that money to, you know, build a new school, just kind of reinforce those messaging. The other way that we see customers use this is when they're getting information requests and they're getting sort of the same question over and over. Perfect opportunity to go in under that, you know, panel and say, you know, this is a question that keeps popping up. Let's answer it proactively. Sorry, can I ask you a couple questions since, that have popped up since since you and I met? Um, sure. And I just noticed this as you were scrolling through. So I've seen on a couple of the sample pages that you put up, um, the most recent data was from 2016. This one is from 2017. Is that a difference between, because we were looking at schools before, is that a difference between the town and school? Um, is, or that's well, yes and town? no. Okay. Right. So you both towns and schools have the option to uh, give us an output from your accounting system okay um, it's a report it's a simple report so it takes five minutes for somebody to run that 
um, if you give us that, you can give us fresher data, you can give us deeper data, and we go in and map it. So there's no work involved on your end other than printing that report. Um, and so in this case, Sudbury has, as, as a town, has given us their 2017. You even have the option of giving us pro forma data, so you can give us budget information. And I'll show you in the back end that you can, let's say, give us a budget, budget information only to make that budget available to you guys, right, to, to the uh, executive committee or to the administrative team, um, as opposed to making it part of the public profile but then maybe decide right before town meeting, hey, we're gonna turn it on so everybody can see the budget in this format that everybody understands and talk about it at town meeting, but totally under your control. So if I understood you correctly, if, if, we, if, um, if we choose, we can make it basically a year more current, but otherwise, most of the, st the information that you're aggregating, like this is, if, if we're mostly seeing FY16 data and we're now in FY18, we're like, looking at two years behind. Yeah, so the, the data that we aggregate automatically is whatever the state has published, okay. right? So they haven't published, you know, 2017 data yet. yet. Yeah. As a very quick aside, um, we've talked to a couple of several other school districts about this. We're working on a project right now um, that would allow you to submit the exact same form that you give to DESI. Mm -hmm. Like you oh. give that to them in a couple of weeks, you're gonna it's gonna be due, right? Um, but they don't usually get around publishing that for another six to nine months. Okay. Uh, but for our customers, what we would do is allow you to submit that. We would provide access to all of that data, so you could do comparative analysis and that sort of thing. It would be you know unaudited. It would be un whatever the right term is by Desi, but it would be there, right? It'd still be very useful data for you to do that analysis nine months ahead of when you would normally get it. So it doesn't exist yet, we're working on it, but that's one of the big feedbacks that we've had from our school clients is, man, I'd love to be able to look at that data, compare it, you know, before next June. Well, and I'll tell you why I'm particularly fixated on dates. Um, there, we just posted today on our website, um, and I'm sure other districts are talking to you about this as well, but the transition from MCAS to this new next generation MCAS um, basically means that the 2017 test data, and I, I don't want to get ahead of Dr. Kavanaugh who's going to give us this update in two weeks, but <laughs> essentially all parents got this letter today, but the 2017 data that we all are getting right now is basically a restart. Right. right, it's a it's a new baseline. You can't compare it to so the, there isn't yeah. yeah, you can't compare it to everything that's in here. Um, and um, I have a little con I, I think that's gonna be already confusing enough. I'm just curious how are you gonna handle that because you have a wealth of Historical. apples to apples comparisons until then and then there's gonna be a blip as there will for all of us and then going forward. So I'm just kinda curious what the plan is. Yeah, so something very similar happened in New York. They sort of changed the normalization of their Regents exam. Um, and um, we, you know, we kind of, uh, in New York, it happened like three years ago. And so the consensus from our customers was, well, just don't show that old stuff, right? right. Um, uh, and so we don't. <laughs> Right, um, we're aware of, of what, exactly what you're talking about, um, and there's a couple of different ways that we could handle it, and we'll sit down and talk with our customers when it when it becomes important. Um, it doesn't make sense to show that in, in a continuous graph, right? Right, because it's like you know my kids thinking I'm an idiot because I only got 1440 on my SATs, right? right. <laughs> <laughs> it was a different scale, um, uh, but. You know, options may be to show two different sets of graphs, sort of here's the old MCAS, right, and here's the new, and then over time, the new MCAS will have trending information. Um, but there may be other options, and okay. we'll sit down and talk with our clients yeah. about that. Great, thank you. I have one question on the data entry. Yep. Um, so can you speak to us a little bit about how does the data get entered into the system, and what are the checks and balances you have in place to make sure that it's accurate? Perfect segue. Thank you. Um, it's like you're a plant. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm going to answer that question by first switching to um, what we call our admin console, right? Okay. So this is this is the back office, right? Everything you've seen so far is publicly available. 
this is the stuff that's you know not for the muggles, right? This is just for for you know you guys, the administrative team. Um, and what it is is a series of apps, uh, and one of them includes uh, this financial app. Um, and so, the the short answer to your question is, you know, we get direct feeds of the data from. Let's just stick with the Desi feed, right? So. 99.9% .9 of the time, the data is exactly as you reported it to Desi, and, and then we take it from them, right? Every once in a while, and it does happen, something gets lost in translation, a digit gets misplaced or whatever. Right. And so we have the ability um, in, in here to actually look at the, the raw numbers. I'm not sure where they're going up here. Um, I'm logged in as Sudbury. Um, so, again, I'm not sure why those. Oh, it's because I'm looking at. Let's just see here. Well, normally, <laughs> the numbers would show up here, and and you have the ability. So, if you see something that's that's out of whack or that's different than what you reported, um, you can go in and and just make a quick adjustment, and you can do it directly in here. You shouldn't have to do any data entry, though, right? We've taken all the data. We've entered all those line items, uh, imported it into our template, right? So the data is all there, but if you see an error, it can be it can be corrected manually. So the onus is on the folks who subscribe to check the accuracy of it. Well, I mean, I guess the short answer is yes. You'd want to look at the at the data to make sure it's consistent with what you've uh, reported. Um, we very, very rarely see any, you know, inconsistencies, right? I mean, it, it, it can happen, which is why we created this feature, um, but it, it really doesn't happen very often. So let me jump back here to um, the other app. So I mentioned earlier the ability to, you know, create your own peer groups. Um, so the process is, you know, very simple here. Um, you go in and say, I want to create a peer group. Um, you can search for or just you know find uh, the peers that you want to um, identify. You drag them over here. You give the peer group a name, and then you can decide for each peer group: is this a peer group that we want to make publicly available as a part of the profile, or is it just something that we want to use for our internal comparative analysis, right? And then you save it. Um, and since I'm actually logged in here, um, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna do that. Um, the cool things that I wanted to show, so the, the apps here also include the ability to customize, to add the commentary like we saw on the Sudbury page. Uh, but the sexy part here is the benchmarking apps. So what the benchmarking app allows you to do is literally compare you know, any line item uh, in your budget. Uh, and I'm just going to kind of select a couple here randomly. Uh, compare any line item in your budget against a relevant set of peer districts. And I emphasize relevant because relevancy depends on what you're looking at, right? If, depending upon the, the um, line items you're looking at, it may be a very different set of peers from one line item to the next, right? And so what we, the way that we handle that is we've created uh, a set of about a dozen or so different filters here that allow you to, f to very quickly sort through and find those matching peers. So for example, you'll see as I activate a filter, over on the right-hand side, it's sorting through, you know, all 404 districts um, in Massachusetts, uh, and coming up with the list of matching peers. Uh, not the world's fastest internet connection here at the moment. You know what? Shoot! Hold on one second. I think I'm going to log back in here. I knew the technology was too good to be crude at all <laughs> work, seamlessly. It's tired at the end of the day. There's only so much has left. There you go. <clears throat> it's actually, well, let's log in as Framingham. Okay. So same concept here. Benchmarking. I'm going to pick a couple of line items, click next, 
select a couple of filters and you'll see here on the filters you know the square in the middle is Framingham and then I've got kind of a range on either side so you can see it, it filtered through you know all 404 districts found 52 that match that particular filter I want to narrow it down a little bit further so I'll activate another filter here so now we've got 10 matches um, and I click next uh, and what comes up is uh, the line items that I selected over on the left hand side and I, again I know you can't read it from there uh, and and Framingham's numbers compared to the 10 districts that most closely matched the filter uh, that, that we created right and I can see that uh, compared one to one to each of these to, compared to an overall peer average from this particular group um, that was selected I can look at that whoops shoot well, I'm not going to do it again. I can look at that at, on a actuals basis, on a per pupil spend basis, on a percent of total budget basis. I can export that information to Excel if I want to dig deeper into it. I can actually save that as a peer group. Um, so if I say, look, this is actually a really good group of schools for us to compare against, I want to come back and look at it. And the real benefits here really primarily, you know, is to help you guys make better fact-based decisions. To have, I mean, you can imagine trying to do all of that work, gather all of that data on your own across all 404 districts. So you just couldn't do it. Um, so you have that data at your fingertips, be able to make those fact-based decisions. Identify in certain scenarios where maybe there are some categories where you could be more efficient with your spend, right? So sort of look for those outliers. Um, and, and communication, right, about being able to take this information, share it both internally, so you're all working from the same numbers, as well as externally, you know, with the community, you know, sort of why we did what we did. Uh, the last piece I'll show you here is just kind of a different way that we do the benchmarking, which is a visualization. So um, in this case, we're looking at a scatter diagram. You know, every blue dot here is a school district in... Massachusetts, the red dot is Framingham. Uh, I'm going to change the parameters here because 400 dots is too many to look at. So I'll scale this down just really quick. And you'll see down at the bottom it's telling me how many matches I have based on the filters that I've selected. That's, that's a good number. Um, so now you can see here visually, you know, Framingham looks kind of like it's about in the middle of, of per pupil spend on employee benefits. We've got an outlier up here, you know, Cambridge. Um, I can look at that on a bar chart basis. Um, I can look at that again on the bell curve and see that, you know, uh, Framingham is, you know, not even a, you know, half a deviation from the mean, right? And again, take all of these charts, all this information, be able to share it. Um, with the community. So that's the, the quick overview. Again, any, any questions about any of the back end pieces or anything at all that uh, you guys are curious about? I, I still have a few questions. Please. Um, so the first one, whether we sign up or not, the data would exist. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, all of this data already exists, right? It's already out there. Okay. Um, and again, unless you sign up, you don't have an opportunity to validate that data as a district. Well, so when I say this data is already out there, it's it's not only is it on ClearGov, but it's out there available on Desi, right? Right, um, right? And so, you know, you have the same opportunity to go check the Desi site to validate that data um, mm -hmm. if you want. And, and that's, I think that's kind of the value, one of the values here is being able to have that data in a way that you can actually understand it sure. in, in you know, much more. I mean, there's no doubt about it that the way you're slicing and dicing, it's, it's really good, and the graphics seem really, really good. Great. Um, and, you know, the question says behind the scenes, the data, you know, when the feed comes in, if there's a problem with the feed and things of that nature. Yep. And that's where my question was coming from, because when I looked at it, you know, you were giving us a preview, I thought I saw 49.1 million as the Hopkinton School budget number. Right. That would have been for 2016. 49.1. I I mean, that's my, um, again, I don't think that was the number. But so I, I think but that I don't know must include there's something. grants. So that's not what the number I we see. vote. I see. Right? I Am see. I right about right. that, Brian? Okay. So, Correct. Right. So yes. that would include, and, and I don't know, because of the way our town does it, employee benefits for the school district are actually carried out on the town side of the budget. So I don't know if that would have been included in that number. Um, 
because of the way that you do your data, but I, that jumped out at me too, Mina, but I, I don't think it's because, I think okay. it's just. Okay, I see. It's, there's more to it exactly. than that. Yeah. Um, then the second question I have for you is, um, you said the rollout happened earlier this year. For schools, so really at the tail end of last year, you know, very tail end of last year, and, and you know, we started with, with civics with towns, mm. particularly in Massachusetts, one of the biggest feedbacks we got from our town customers was, hey, education is the biggest chunk of our budget, right? We'd like to see deeper dive of that, right? Um, and we heard that in other states as well, and so we said, hey, we should do a school version of this, and so we started rolling out the school version across all 50 states for so far. <laughs> So would you be able to share with us how many uh, districts in Massachusetts have signed up? Yeah, so it's, it's over 50 communities that we're already working with. Um, you know, in the kind of Metro West area, it's uh, Medfield, Sudbury, Wayland, Medway. Framingham. Medway. Medway, uh, Easton, uh, Wellesley. <laughs> I get credit for Easton all these years later. Just the connection. Um, <laughs> Those are some I remember off the top of my head. I see. I see. So. And given the volume of data that you handle, how is the performance like? I mean, it's looking good the, with the speed with which you've been moving. Yeah. Um, but is this the actual, this is the live I'm, I'm site? I'm live, yeah. Okay. I'm live. Okay. Yeah. Performance, no issues. Performance, no issues. And, and so we're hosted on the Amazon cloud, and so we can ramp up. We can literally quadruple our performance in about 10 minutes if we need to. And would we have access only to Massachusetts data or? Well, so all of the profile data is is available to everybody, right? Um, the the back end, the admin piece, um, all of that benchmarking is done uh, within the state, right? Because there really are significant di differences from state to state in terms of how they report it, how they categorize it. And, you know, it starts to become two apples to oranges. Like I said, you know, the visuals are certainly uh, very good. Sexy, right? <laughs> Does anybody else have a question? I have a, probably more of a front-end question. So you've, you've rolled this out. I, I guess the question is actually probably between the, the town and the school site. Like, what are you seeing as far as traffic goes? Because obviously one of the... the potential uses of this is communication with the community. Are you seeing an uptick in communities accessing it from places that aren't town hall or the school <coughs> district? Um, so the short answer is yes, right? And a lot of that depends on how actively the community uh, promotes it, right? So like with Amesbury schools, if they put it on their homepage, right, we get a ton of traffic to right. those. If they bury it three pages deep, not as much. Right. Um, we're also, this is, I guess, a little bit of inside information. So we've aggregated now the world's largest municipal finance database. That data is really interesting on, in a lot of other scenarios, for example, real estate websites, right? Um, small town news websites, like a, like a patch or a Metro West Daily News or something like that. Um, and so, you know, I can't talk about the specifics, but we are now um, licensing that mm. data in, in aggregate into various sort of distribution categories, distribution um, partners, right, where you'll start to see, you know, a sort of mini town profile, let's say, on a real estate site um, powered by ClearGov, right, or a mini town profile on a, you know, local news uh, uh, media site powered by ClearGov. And so but, we're actually broadcasting that out in a much bigger net. But our decision to contract with you wouldn't impact that, right? Wouldn't. So you're, you're still putting that out to those sites that, because the data is just public data you're aggregating. So whether or not we sign on, the Hopkinton data will still go out to those aggregators. Uh, yes. The impact on whether you sign up or not is basically how much data is available, yep. whether you have the full profile there or just the, the preview. Um, as well as, you know, any other context that you want to provide to right. help tell the story, right? So that's the impact. Yep. Okay. I'm good. Okay. So I just want to make sure we understand all of the options, and um, and we're going to have a vote at, at a later time, but uh, later down on the agenda. But I just want to make sure the options, basically, that we have available to us are we can claim the free portion, right, right of the website. 
we can um, we both we have the invoices in our packet that everybody's looked at before so we can find money in this year's budget to sign on and turn it on and the ramp up time is it's I mean it's it's pretty instantaneous okay. we, we typically do a, a kickoff call with whomever you want right and we kind of take you through a little bit slower version of what I did make sure you kind of know which buttons to press it's it's obviously not hard I mean if I can do it you know anybody can do it um, oh, yeah, yeah, you're but we sort of take you through that and get you make sure you're all comfortable with that um, show you how to set up a new user that kind of thing okay and then that's, that's usually a half hour call okay um, and the timeline for the town turning theirs on they're basically waiting on our decision is that correct yeah um, I meant to check that um, so Hopkinton Town has signed up for the service. They're a premier customer yet uh, now. I don't know. Uh, I mean, their their profile is up and running, so we've turned that on already. Okay. Um, but I don't know their timing on when they're going to sort of publicly announce, do a press release launch, that kind of thing. Okay. So our two other options. Well, is there an option if we were not to, to if if we let's say for example claimed our free portion of the website? Can, is there data that we can add to the town? portion since they're already signed on that enhances the school view within the town within the town um, not really, not really. Um, because okay. the, the within the town profile the education budget line item is kind of rolled up okay so okay. And, and we don't break that out we break that out on the school version okay and then so really our third option then is um, if we can't do it this year or elect not to do it this year we can do it for starting in FY we could budget for it in FY19 right, right. Mm -hmm. okay so I just want to make sure that all of our options are on the table and that everybody understands that got their questions answered um, because we also once we get to our um, director of finance report I think that report is gonna have a have a heavy impact on our um, on our deliberation around this this and all other budget items really for this year and next year so I just um, have updated information from from our director of finance and I want to make sure that we also consider that before making this decision so ordinarily I'd move the vote forward but I'm gonna not do that tonight just because of the impact of what she's about to tell us so um, Jean I think the one option that you that you I didn't hear you say okay. and I don't think we actually even talked about this now that I think about it last time is um, we we don't do less than a, a one-year subscription right uh -huh. that's sort of our minimum subscription but we do have the option of there's what eight months left in eight and a half months left in this fiscal year right so we can we can give you the option to in essence sign up for a 20 month subscription so this year the rest of this year and next mm -hmm. we prorate the charge now so let's just say you start uh, November 1st right that's when you launch so in essence we charge you now for eight months so it reduces your out-of-pocket in the short term mm -hmm. and then it renews in you know July 1 you can opt out if you want of course you're not gonna want to no. but you could um, you renew and then you pay you be on sort of a um, fiscal cycle at that point right okay. so you'd renew every year on January Thank you. Or, July 1st so I don't think I. You did not hear me that. say that. What's so that? You're, you, you're correct. You did not hear me say that. So yeah. thank you. <laughs> thank you. So for that, that is a, a, a option. You know, save you a little bit of money in the short term. Excellent. Okay, that's wonderful. Thank you very much. Any other questions, really quick, before? Okay, Brian, thank you very hey, much for your time. My pleasure, guys. Thanks. It's um, it's a really compelling tool. Yes, I think John would like to Can comment. So the, the short answer is you could, right? So I mentioned um, uh, that you have the ability to correct errors in the data, right? You know, if they're in the in the rare instance when that <coughs> happens, um, 
But you'd have the option to say, oh, well, it's not an error, but we want to sort of change that number to reflect what you're talking about. And so, yeah, you could go in and, and make those changes. Yeah. Thank you and, very and, much. And by the way, since, since the town is, you could make it on both profiles so that it would balance out the right way. It would look good. That's great. Thank you, Brian, very cool. much. That was Thank, that you. Was Thank you. Thanks for the time. Really appreciate it. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Um, all right. Well, let's get quickly into liaison reports. Do you want to? We'll just start down that way and work our way towards me. Um, I don't have anything big to report. There's been work going on on the communication, community communications, and uh, Dr. McLeod and I uh, we've been talking further about it, and we have a meeting coming up. Likewise, for the senior center, we have a meeting coming up. So I should have. Uh, oh. There is one update, though. We um, just attended the Tech 50th anniversary, which was amazing. It was at the State House. And on behalf of Hopkinton, Dr. McLeod, Jean, and myself, we went uh, this afternoon. And it was a wonderful ceremony. Um, and Tech celebrated that 50th birthday. So it was quite amazing to see how, over the 50 years, how far um, the work on um, students with special needs has come. Uh, it was quite something. And we sat at the table with one of the honored guests. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. absolutely. Roger Rich. Is that yes, right? I think so. Who was honored um, and had been tech director for th almost 30 years. Wow. Yeah, so that was pretty cool. Yes. I have not attended any subcommittee meetings since our last school committee meeting. Next week is heavily loaded. I'll be back <laughs> <laughs> We'll carve out an hour from that. Yes, day. exactly. Once a man. So I guess you're going in this order. I get to do the, 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 the field one. Um, so we had a, a, a wonderful um, forum last night for the athletic field subcommittee. It was extremely well attended. We probably had close to, I think, a, close to 100 people there, um, many of whom um, signed up and signed email addresses for the first time. So, you know, hitting on new people. Um, there was great conversation, a lot of really good questions. Um, I think people were very appreciative of the information, and there's definitely a lot of, of interest in this project. Um, so it was, I, I thought it was extremely successful, and, and everybody did a really nice job promoting it. And uh, Dr. McLeod, um, D. King, all did wonderful jobs presenting. So. Great. I watched you on Facebook. Nice. Yeah, and it was broadcast on HCAM <laughs> and Facebook. That's wow. right. Yeah. So if you missed it, you yeah. should just, it's already on um, HCAM's YouTube channel. So it's publicly available, and we absolutely encourage people to, to watch. Mm -hmm. um, and then, yeah, I think that's all I have. Okay, I, uh, I went to a CPAC meeting on Tuesday night, and they had the Accept Collaborative Transition Coordinator. I know for those of us who were here in the spring, that was a big topic of conversation, was the transition coordination and services in the district. They have somebody that they're using through the collaborative that we get for a certain number of hours a month. She was there to talk and to hear some of the you know, concerns that the community has in looking at some things going forward. So that was, I thought, a productive meeting. Uh, and then I also, Parks and Rec had asked me to come back and just update this. I had sat with Dan Mazer from the Special Education Department with some members from Parks and Rec, Jay Golfi, and a parent uh, to help advise them on uh, helping with inclusion of uh, students with dis not students but kids with disabilities who attend the playground group in the summer and Denise Hild Hildreth was also part of that group and they actually seems like they don't actually need as much help from us as we had thought they might that they took some ideas from the table and they are looking to run with that with Parks and Rec so because yeah. it just <laughs> reminded me of something um, so I focused on the forum but yeah since our last meeting um, Ms. Birchman, um, Ms. King, and I also met with uh, CPC um, to begin discussing the potential of funding part of the, uh, the turf field as a um, CPC initiative at next year's town meeting. Um, it was a good meeting. I thought they had, again, some good questions, as we keep finding every time we present this. Um, but there I would describe them as generally supportive of the idea of providing some support, as I think we've discussed before. CPC is limited in specifically what they can fund. So there are certain things like anything having to do with the carpet or the infill they cannot fund through CPC funds. So their their next steps are um, they're going to get guidance from town council about what specific line items that they would potentially be able to fund, look at how much they have, and then call us back 
uh, to a meeting to discuss what they could potentially do. But I would say that was an extremely positive meeting as well. And I'm really done now. <laughs> um, I'll just, uh, the, the only other thing I'll add is that we, um, we have talked about offering a site visit for people. Um, and so I don't know if generally there's interest on the committee in attending that. Um, that's something that we offered to CPC. They're meeting tonight and um, the, the support staff for that. CPC said she would check and see um, what the level of interest was from that committee as well. Um, so just stay tuned on that. I think it would be, I think it's really a lot easier to conceptualize it when you're standing there sort of seeing what the scope of the project would be. So um, hopefully we'll be doing that before because I don't really go outside if it's below 40 degrees. So we're going to do that in the next couple I of I highly days. recommend the site tour with D yeah. on the buggy. Oh, <laughs> well, we can't all fit on the cart, but um, <laughs> but we can all meet down there. So, um, and I think for me, the only other liaison report that I have is that we did start this week. Um, Dr. McLeod and Ms. Rothermick and I had our first uh, budget, what are we calling it, advisory budget group, budget yep. advisory group, one advisory of those advisory. Mm -hmm. um, meetings with the uh, town manager, town finance director, and the chair of the board of selectmen. So we have kicked off that process. And, oh, excuse me, and appropriations kicked off that, that process and then we're uh, planning to meet again in about a month. Um, so unless there are other liaison reports, um, I'll move right into my report. A couple of things to report to you. First, um, we have had some public comment th through email. Uh, we had an email that I believe went to all of us regarding school start time. Mm -hmm. And I did reply all just because it was just a factually based um, answer based on a decision that we made last year and sent the minutes to the person who was wanting to understand more about where the district stands on that. And then also um, Nancy and I had had um, somebody reach out to us from the special education parent community. So we had the opportunity to meet with them and referred them to Dr. McLeod for follow-up conversation. So that was all I believe that we received in terms of public comment in between the meetings. Um, I do want to publicly announce the results of our executive session from prior to this meeting. We did review um, and approve the meetings of the executive sessions uh, sessions held on June 6, 2017, as well as August 14, 2017, and we also voted to release those minutes. Um, so those were the results of that executive session. Um, and then in addition, I have approved for payment the accounts payable warrants number 1-019, 1 18-10, okay, 18-019, <laughs> and 18-020. All of the warrants have been included in your packet. I have also approved for payment the payroll warrants S18008 and S1808B. All warrants have been included in your packet. So that is the full update, um, I believe, for me. I, it also says on the agenda superintendent search, but I think we'll just talk about that under old business when we get to it. Um, so. We're getting so efficient. I know. So I'm trying to beat our record of last the last time. Well, so go ahead, Dr. McLeod. I will also be brief because I know that that um, some of my things will also overlap with with Ms. Rothermick's um, report. The the main thing to report is um, that yes, and the MCAS results, the next generation MCAS results were in fact released. The the overall to the public yesterday. The individual reports should be coming are are slated to come by Tuesday of next week. So. Families should be receiving them by the end of the week. But in the interim, um, there I, I have shared uh, Desi's PowerPoint explaining the major point differences between um, th what they're calling now the legacy MCAS and the next generation MCAS. Um, and there are significant changes, and parents should 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 expect some some differences in the report. Um, so in the interim, there will be a letter. It didn't quite get out today, uh, but Jean is right. It was supposed to. With the po the PowerPoint did in fact get posted. The letter will get out tomorrow from me, uh, basically explaining some high points of the differences. Um, then parents should expect their individual reports next week, um, along with which then I think will will give them a preview to what they might expect when they first get the results. The main thing um, that I want to be able to preempt is is an overreaction or concern to the change in levels um, and have parents think about ahead of time that th this is really a baseline. This is not something that people should be alarmed at. We were expecting across the state 
to have to re-regulate and, and figure out where we are. Um, you'll get a much more detailed presentation, not only on our performance, but on some highlights. And um, uh, Dr. Cavanaugh is going to be providing a, a, a thorough, um, as she always does, presentation um, at the November, the first November meeting, but there'll also be an opportunity at that meeting for us to have discussion around things that you're hearing in the community, for folks to ask questions, attend if they, if they wish, or simply um, send their questions that they want clarified at that meeting. So lots of opportunity for discussion, um, but in a nutshell is not something that I'm concerned about, um, that, I, that I'm hoping that we can allay concerns about individual performance on this measure and to reassure families that we have many other ways of assessing and measuring individual student growth. Um, more than we, when, not, not only do we have a lot of other measures, but we use those measures just as much as we use MCAS measures when we're planning for instruction throughout the year anyway. Um, so more to come on MCAS, all things MCAS, um, but unless you have specific questions tonight, I will pass it on to um, Ms. Rothermick. Great. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So um, thank you. As, as you know, we're into the season of budget, um, and a couple of things that are coming to as part of that is we have three uh, big contracts that will expire at the end of this year. Um, our transportation contract, our food service contract, and our before and after care contract end at the end of this year. So we'll be looking at those. And then, of course, as, as we said, we're into the budget process and beginning the process with the budget advisory. Um, so we'll get through each one of those points. So a couple things I wanted to kind of break down each one of those that I touched on. For transportation, um, some of the things that we're looking at currently, if you follow along in what I put in here, our current policy right now allows students to have a different drop-off both in the AM and the, and the PM. They can choose their home um, bus and they can choose a child care location. So in essence, they have a seat on two different bus routes. And currently there are over 200 students that have this or take advantage of this um, opportunity according to our policy. So. We looked around at several um, surrounding communities to see uh, what the policies look like in other districts. And really what we're looking at in our concern is really the safety. Um, when you have 200, and again, these are our youngest riders, these are your, your little ones in elementary school, that have a different bus arrangement Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and there are 200 of them, the difficulty and the concern around the safety of making sure that on that day they're going to the right place it has become quite challenging, as you can see from, from these numbers. So as you look at this policy, um, which will come up at, a, at another meeting, um, it's your student transportation policy, EEA. This is one of the pieces of that policy that you know I would ask the committee to consider looking at um, and making those drop-offs five days a week, that, that consistency. And again, it's really looking around the, the safety of, of the children. Um, so, and again, it is the two seats on a bus, which can have budget implications. So something to keep in mind. So as we look at that contract that we'll be putting that out to bid, um, that will be done soon. Um, some of the strategies will be increasing the bus size that we request within that contract to try to maximize our capacity. Um, and cameras and GPS is a, is a new uh, thing that we'll be adding to that, that bid. So there any, we'll kind of break this down. Are there any questions around just the transportation piece? I, I had one that I'm just trying to wrap my brain around because I did actually ask Kathy. So that kids can be dropped off or picked up in the morning at their home and dropped off at their daycare in the afternoon as long as it's five days a week? Correct. How does that change the double, having kids have to have double seats? So right now, um, say for instance in the afternoon, three days a week you go to childcare, two days a week you go home. We have a seat on those two different buses. So it, just 
for example, then if my child was riding bus two to get to school in the morning and bus 16 then to get daycare, you don't it, that doesn't require two seats. That the afternoon list is different than the morning list. Exactly. Okay. That right. makes sense. So yeah. it would be five days a week. Sure. For the morning, I, five days a week for the afternoon. Exactly. Thank you. Yeah. And I know the math doesn't break out this way, but we have about <clears throat> 90 students on a bus. Uh, no, about. No. Um, 59 is what we consider okay, capacity. So, 60, so, so this is essentially three buses. I know it doesn't work out exactly like that, Correct. but I mean, you could think about and, and whatever the bus costs us a year. I mean, it's not an, an it's not an insubstantial amount. Oh, did I say that the right it's way? Insignificant, maybe. And not an ex yeah expense. So I, I think that that's I think as we as we go through it, I think putting a number on it is really helpful yeah. in terms of putting some context for families because obviously I've I've been through discussion of the transportation policy more times than I would like to count in my legacy um, time <coughs> on the school committee and um, it's always challenging and emotional conversation and so I think you know the more fact based context we can add into it will be really helpful right. when we get to that point. Just to, to put uh, the numbers in context, it's about $60,000 per bus okay. to, to put um, the financing to it. And you're right, transportation is an emotional issue. Yeah. Um, so, but you have to keep in mind, and what, what I keep reminding and going back to is it's really safety. Right. You know, and it's also really having the need of an ec extra person to really manage this. That's correct. Beyond what we are. So it's not just the bus cost, it's a staff cost too, yep. and I understand that as right. well. But I just want to make sure. If I can add to the safety concern um, of the 200 students that, that Sue points out, within that population there are also daily changes on top of that. Mm -hmm. So there's the managing of all of these requests in general, but then there are daily changes that are being asked within those requests as well as all of the other students who ride the bus for different reasons. For example, it couldn't be, might not be the situation that you pointed out. It right. could be a child that's on the same bus coming back and forth every day, but on this day I want them to get off at a different spot, a stop, which we also allow as part of our policy. So there's a lot of requests on a single day. Um, and then and there was another point that I wanted to make that had to do with, oh, that to your point, Jean, about taking up the transportation policy numerous times, um, and I've been long, here long enough to, to be, have been part of a couple of discussions, we wanted to be very respectful for the needs around daycare. Mm -hmm. um, and so part of the discussions that we've been having has been very much thinking about the daycare needs of families and how can we consider those needs while also prioritizing and helping folks to understand that with our rising enrollments, and the numbers of small children that we're transporting, um, there's there's this increasing safety concern and increasing numbers of mistakes that are being made. Mm -hmm. And one mistake is is one mistake too many when it comes to Young getting kids. a child to the right place. Mm -hmm. Susan, are you able to share some of the districts that you said you looked into uh, which have this kind of a policy? If you would like to. So while, while Susan's looking yeah. that up, because mine is more of a, a agenda-driven. So uh, <coughs> given that I am also one of those veterans who has a lot of experience reviewing this transportation policy, it seems like it would really be a good idea to get this discussion on an agenda very, very soon. Because I think we want, if, if a change like this is going to be made, we've dipped our toe in the water of these changes a couple of times, and it hasn't. It's driven, a, it's driven a lot of conversation in the community. So, so that you know, John, all of this is time. This, by soon it will be the next meeting. That's, um, that's And the other reason this is all timed yeah. around the, the bids. Right. As well as our understanding that people have to make uh, daycare decisions by early February. Okay. So we've been planning this discussion ever since I was waiting for Susan to arrive, <laughs> <laughs> um, knowing that this was really you know, timely, uh, that we needed to be very aware, aware of the timeline of the discussion. So we just wanted to really get a sense tonight if if there was even any interest in even opening the discussion. Um, and so we wanted to gather your questions so that when we come back in two weeks, we'll have more information. I think it's a worthwhile discussion to have. I mean, it's, it seems yeah. like 
there are a number of mistakes I have heard anecdotally of kids being dropped off at homes where there was not somebody where they weren't expected to be. Um, yep. But I, with John, I have not been on this side of the table, but I have seen the conversation in the past. I do think that it would be worth making sure the public has ample opportunity to be aware that we're discussing it. Well, and one of the, um, as we're talking to districts about this consistent policy of five day a week, um, one of the discussions that we keep bringing back to is your charge is education. Yeah. Right. And that really right. should be your focus. Right. So, you know, our charge is transportation to and from the home. Your charge is education. So having all these little if-then statements within policy, just something to think about. Right. Uh, and, Mina, to your, uh, to your question, the um, districts that we were able to get to that have five days a week, um, Newburyport, Carlisle, Milford, Southboro, Northboro, Milford, Bellingham, Northbridge, Medway. Just a few were enough, but thank you. You, you <laughs> seem just, to have done a, I mean, a just better to give job you an there. Idea, so. Sure. Uh, and, you know, I was asking this of um, Dr. McLeod earlier today, um, you know, that if I'm a parent who commutes to Boston four days a week, uh, week and one day I work from home and four days I send my child to a daycare center and, and the last day, you know, on a Friday, I'd like the child to get off at home. And to what you were saying earlier that we are not, you know, our focus is education and not attending to all of this and just hearing some of the safety concerns that you talked about even earlier, um, I think that it's worthwhile to review it. I agree. I mean, I think in terms of both the safety standpoint as well as um, a cost uh, analysis, um, I think as much as I was hoping it would take place next year, I think it's time, <laughs> time to have the conversation again. So, I, I mean, I think you're getting a general nod of the heads that we would like to have this, um, this but conversation. Can I, can I <coughs> recognizing sort of where we are in the budget calendar with respect to that, too. So, so I know I have a question to Jean about the, the 200 students and extra seats and is there any way that we could get some even rough modeling of kind of what the cost differences would be? I mean, you're talking, of, you're also talking about larger buses, so I don't know if that changes the impact. I know we're not going to be able to get right there by two weeks from now, but I mean, in, in, in a very you know general sense, if you were to take away one bus again, you know, it's it's sixty thousand you know right. sixty thousand dollars. So, but I guess the big question is, does this really take away one bus if we get rid of it? Uh, rid of it, or mm, mm, right? Like what does because if this is <clears throat> spread out amongst right. the entire district, it may not take away a whole bus. It might take away like seat equivalents of a whole bus, but it's not actually a bus. Right. And and so that's where I would say, you know, to actually give you a definitive, you would be redoing routes. So it, that's a longer term right. process. Okay. Um, so I, I agree with you that it's not something that we can say definitively, you know, we can take that bus off the budget. Mm -hmm. You know, that's why I'm telling you that the focus really should be on, on the safety. Yep and we'll play it through the budget process, um, but you would have to redo routes and, okay. and see where. Um, yeah. And I don't, obviously, I'm not going to ask, wouldn't ask you to go to that level. I didn't know if there was some easier modeling that could be done, so then I'm, I'm good. Yeah. But I will add, again, to the safety issue, the safety conversation, that one thing that would have a budget impl implication is that if we felt we had to add staffing. Right. Um, right. End of day, additional clerical help to make sure that we're getting every child on the right, because we all know that we also have contractual obligations that teachers only have so much time at the end of the day. So th that definitely would also have a budgetary um, implication, and I think that we can come back with a with some dollar figure to help us balance the discussion as well. Okay. And before we leave the topic of, uh, of busing, does anybody have any questions regarding the um, piece around the contract? I just had one question just because of the um, the – people that came last time to public comment and I know you're going to um, add a couple of new requests into the bid. I don't know if it's possible to have a conversation in the context of the bid about negotiating the bus to, to go on some of the unapproved roads. I know currently they cannot because of their insurance and it may be that that's never a negotiable, um, but given you know the, the questions that we've had um, 
just if that's a conversation that's allowable to have during that process, I think it would be a good answer um, to be able to give to people. Yeah, I, you don't have to answer me now. That's just and, <laughs> and I and I'm not sure that we can tell them how their insurance company will insure them. Right. So that it may be, just be an absolute no starter. But yeah, and and I will say um, so in light of you know what the the conversations were. Um, again, I've asked other districts if it, if other districts are are allowing their buses on unapproved roads. I have not gotten okay. the district respond back that they do yet. Okay. Um, you know, I can continue to monitor those responses, but so far everybody has said no. Okay. Well, that's helpful enough. Yeah. Um, you know, the other piece to the conversation, and I know the the presentation um, at the last school committee meeting you know, is, is always that reminder that it is the parent responsibility to get their children to and from the stop. Mm -hmm. um, so our responsibility begins when they load the bus. And I know one of their concerns was the safety on the road, you know, getting to and from the stop. So, you know, that is always an answer that we have to parents because that, you know, that is the reality of, of you know, what our policy is. So, um, Susan, I, sorry, go ahead, Nancy. If we're looking at possibly, the, it sounds like they may be looking at different buses, physical buses, if they're looking at more capacity. Is there any thought of looking into buses with seatbelts? Is that, I don't know if that would drive a cost or, I was thinking of safety, but also just some things I've heard online about small children having trouble staying in their seats. Right, <laughs> so so there there has been a lot of discussion back and forth about um, seatbelts on buses and the, um, the evidence goes back and forth in terms of whether that is truly a safer way and um, to transport children. And, and I'll give you a for instance. Um, buses are built higher up off the, off the road on purposefully. Uh, so if they were to be broadsided, most of the impact goes under a bus. So, so that's, that's one of the points as opposed to hitting direct, which would happen with a car where you're hitting direct and the seat belt is actually keeping you in your seat. So most of the impact ends up underneath a bus. Um, so that's one point. When you have a bus where, and, and so for that reason, it's also very rare for a bus to roll over. So that being said, we did have a bus roll over. The kids did come out of their seats, um, bumps and bruises, but the, down, the, the other factor to keep in mind, then the driver was able to evacuate all the students off the bus. Um, had they been in seat belts, now these were little, little ones, you have to, now you have struggling, upset children. The bus drivers are all equipped with a blade. Now he has to go and try to cut 50 I'm students out, of, out, of, out, out of a bus. Yeah. Um, if there's an issue when it, roles and you know now now it's a time so jury's out oh, as yeah. to whether that's really a safer option I can i make a clarifying that. point for the viewing public that was in your former district yes. you had a bus rollover yes. we Hopkins did not did have a bus rollover yes. <laughs> <laughs> so make sure anybody watching who's looking at police Just reports saying. right now that did not happen in Hopkins. <laughs> That, that is true. So in, in all my years of busing, there, there was an incident. And yes. it wasn't because of an impact. It was because of a swerve that it then, you know, and ended up off a road. So, I'm, so what I'm saying is, but then you have students that are now trapped in right. seatbelts. Right. Right. So I never would. I appreciate the level of detail you gave on that for a question I did not ask you in advance. So thank you. Uh, she I has have a level of detail on everything. She does. Um, Susan, you called out um, the cameras and the GPS system on all buses. Can you speak a little bit to that? Well, you have cameras on, on the buses. Right. So the GPS uh, is the added security of being able to um, <coughs> find a bus when there's an incident instead of relying on communication of radios. Well, you know, ABC Road is now closed. You know, where are you? Let me help route you around. If you have GPS, you bring up all your buses on the screen and you can see exactly where they are on what road and you can tell them how to detour around an issue on a road, whether it be a house fire or, you know, Which an accident, we did have whatever. Here. <laughs> we did have. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so we've had that. 
Um, so to be able to communicate with buses and visually see where they are and help them navigate to get around the issues, that's what the GPS does. But in addition, it also gives you that added information. It gives you speed. It gives you time that you open and close doors. You know, you have parents who call and say, you know, bus 10 was going 100 miles an hour. Well, no, GPS says it's 35. You know, so it gives you better informed data to make the public and, and your parents feel better. Thank you. Okay, so food service is our next. Uh, did you have a question, Jen? No. Oh, okay. No, I'm food service food is services. our next. Um, so food service, again, this is another contract that expires this year. Um, so currently the district is, man is uh, the cafeterias are managed by an outside a management company. Um, currently it's Whitson's. All the cafeteria staff <coughs> are employees of Hopkinton, and just the, the manager is an employee of, of Whitson's, the director. Um, so one of the things that I'm looking at is making our food service just fully self-op, uh, which would mean hiring our own director. Uh, a lot of the kitchens, in terms of the infrastructure, and we'll talk a little bit about capital in a little bit, need some repair and some, and some work. So being able to take away the money that we're paying to an outside management company, we would then be able to direct back into the uh, food service operation um, to make it more of a sustainable um, cash flow. And to give you an idea, um, some of the things that we're paying for is obviously for the director, the, that payroll, the business insurance, their own software. So we have a point of sale, but they also maintain their own point of sale. A management fee and an administrative fee, um, which adds up to about 180000 So you add in, you know, you hire your own director. You're still talking a positive cash flow of you know, potentially ninety to hundred thousand um, dollars for the food service operation. So, just directionally, you're looking for <clears throat> us to say, do we want you to pursue that, or do we not? Right. Basically. So, basically, with this bid, I would advise not going out to bid and pursuing hiring, uh, you know, our own director. And so, I'm seeing general support and nodding of the head for 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 bringing that forward in the budget process. That would be great. Thank you. So we didn't want to make that assumption and in, in, in coming because the way we do budget with you each each at each meeting, um, this was something that, that Susan wanted to review with you ahead of time. So thank you for your feedback on that. I have one question here. Have we always had an outside company manage for Hopkinton schools? In the time that I've been here, always, okay. and I'm old, so it's been a long time if it, if it wasn't. And it could have been that I don't know how far back, Mina, but it may be in the past they, sure. they had, yeah. we also had, they had their staff, but over time, certainly as Susan points out, the staff are, 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 are all of our staff except for the managers. So. Yeah, nine years is a good. Yep. Yeah, at least for nine years. And I think it's always, we've always negotiated with them, so I think it's yeah. always been our staff, but it's been, but we've had Aramark yep. and now Wilson. Different districts do it in different ways, and yeah, it's. Yeah, so I, I've seen it several different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, no, that's Good. an excellent Good. suggestion. Mm -hmm. I think that just is kind of evidence of the the fresh eyes approach to um, you know to our whole budget process. So, thank you. That's great. Okay. Uh, and then the next piece is your before and after care program. So that this currently is being run by the Metro West uh, YMCA. So we've begun some discussions with the principals basically on how the program is, is running and developing that, that vision um, for next year. Looking at the locations, currently it's operated out of Hopkins and Elmwood, you know, so looking at the, the locations for next year and, and defining where that would be. It's not currently run at center. Would it be run at Marathon? So we're, we're beginning those um, discussions. And the... Um, Right now, a market report is being done looking at all Metro Boston um, aftercare that schools have and, and coming up with the pricing because, as you know, we established kind of a minimum pricing for the bid. So that, uh, that work is being done now. So I'll, I will bring you the results of that because that will be something that will be um, part of the bid process. So that will be coming. Great. Okay. In a future meeting. Any questions? Okay. 
So. Okay, and then the last piece, is, as we talked about, um, obviously we're in, we're in the process of the, the budgets and asking all of the cost centers to put together their, their budgets. Um, one of the, the issues that have come about this year and I've brought to you is really the change in the out-of-district tuitions this year. So as you know, in the previous meetings, we've done some budget transfers to cover changes that have happened for students for this year, which of course then moving forward for the FY19 will have a budget impact because that is an increase. Um, the other piece is our change in our um, circuit breaker. So as happens in, in every district, as, as we struggle to close the budget gap between what the town can afford and, and what the, the district's needs are, um, a lot of times what you do is you overutilize a, a revolving account. And so that's been the case with the circuit breaker in order for you to close that budget gap in the last couple years. Um, so, but that's created that structural deficit that come for fiscal 19 it is an issue. Um, so between the change in the out of district tuitions and having less available circuit breaker funds for next year, that's a significant increase to the budget when we're trying to stay within the constraints of the, the, the budget message. Um, you know, as, as you know, the, the town, the, the money is the money, um, and it's, it's all one pot of money no matter what, excuse me, department you are within the town. Um, so this, this will become a difficulty. So what we're looking at, and we brought this up with the budget ad advisory committee, I guess we're calling ourselves, um, is actually separating that discussion, so the, the out-of-district tuitions from the rest of the school budget. So we just kind of laid that issue on, on the table, um, just, you know, for you to know and, you know, kind of your thoughts around the, the budget going forward because, of course, to stay within that budget um, message, when you add in that out-of-district tuition, just that piece alone, it'll skew you know, your remaining cost centers, mm -hmm. so. And Susan, this is a one-year correction, is that? I think what you're seeing is an unusual year. Right. Um, you know, so your your structural funding piece is something that eventually does come to roost. And, and like I said, every district does this. It's not unusual um, as you're trying to struggle and close budgets. So that's a, that's a correction. That's a one-year correction. Um, and your changes, you know, as you know, in special education can be erratic. Mm -hmm. So this seems to be an unusual year where you have a lot of uh, changes in student needs. The reason I'm asking, well, A, just for going forward purposes, just how prepared we need to be to expect a, a change of this magnitude um, every year, but also B, I was at a Board of Selectmen meeting several weeks ago where a finance report was given and there was an unusually high amount of free cash for this year and so not my money to spend at all but I thought possibly a solution if it's a one year problem um, that's something that we could have a conversation with the town about is you know is there a portion of that money that would be available at least for a portion of this if there's sort of a non-recurring fix that's needed and then we'll have you know, to put a different structure in place or, or project differently or, or however you're going to um, correct the rest of it. So that really is the reason that I'm, I mean, aside from just wanting to plan uh, for future purposes, but that, that was sort of the reason for my question. Yeah. Um, so basically what you're asking for from us in this particular uh, area is our comfort level with doing two budgets, sort of. It, so just exactly. Call, call, calling this out separately, I want to be really clear in our messaging that we're not, you know, we're not blaming our special needs population. This no. is just an unusual circumstance, and because of its impact on the overall budget, we want to make sure that we really understand why it's so critical this year for the, this particular. Well, for example, Susan, the percent we were looking at yesterday of this number, what would this? What was this? Per, this percent, if we take it out, was what of our whole operating? We um, we kind of knew what it was. It, well, if, if for our special education, yeah. If you look at the change in special education, it's about seven. Um, 
seven percent. So if leaving yeah. it in, it would be a ten percent increase. Yeah. Okay. So by pulling out just the out of district, your change in special mm -hmm. education is you know down in that two percent. Yeah. Um, right. You know, so that extra bringing it up to a 10% change just within one cost center. Right. And like I said, it really... Disproportionate. It, it's skewing the information. Yeah. Um, so, in, and it's it's difficult, you know, as, as, as we all know. Um, but at the end of the day, it it becomes, you know, disproportionate, as uh, Dr. McLeod says. And, and unpredictable. So that's the other challenge around that particular budget piece is that, you know... <laughs> As you know, we work really hard to plan for and to make corrections and to put things in place where we know that we want improvement. But in this regard, there's, there's often little that we can do um, to predict these kinds of increases. Sometimes there's, there, there's an expectation, and we plan for that. Um, Move-ins, um, unexpected changes, um, you know, tragedies, things that happen um, that as we plan our budget right now over the next few months, we won't have a way of predicting unless we build in the extra, which we don't do. We don't, we don't want to build in the extra, so that's not something we've done over time. But, and the, the, the circuit breaker, despite its name, is, is not actually, it, 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 it's a year delay yep. in terms of helping us fund right those changes. So That's it's correct. not as if we can utilize, we can rely on if our costs go up, at least we'll have circuit breaker to fall back on. That's actually not coming for another full budget year yeah, right. when these costs go up. So we don't have a built-in mm -hmm. funding mechanism mm -hmm. to cover that. Mm -hmm. and, and the other piece that a lot of people um, don't understand, and circuit breaker is difficult to understand, um, is that, well, you have your special education costs, well, you get 70% of that. Well, it, you know, there's more to it than that. So there is a foundation level. So the foundation level is about 43,000. Everything over and above <clears throat> that 43,000, you get a percentage back. And circuit breaker percentage changes annually. Um, so this year is actually the lowest percentage I've ever seen. It's at 65%. So, you know, that added to our woes for this year. Um, so typically you can see it around 69, 70, and up to 72, but 65 is, is very low. So, And the percent is changes based on the community, correct? No, so the percent changes based on the state budget. Okay, so but there's a different, there's a different formula depending on what community you're in? No, so this one, for this one does not okay. for circuit breaker. Okay. Yep. So just in simple terms, we we have more students in the in this category moving in. It, does this also this is the category that also that includes um, ELO expenses or no, no? No, no. Okay. So we have more people, more more students. But Norfolk that Aggies in this, right? No, uh, Norfolk no. Aggie is not in this not piece in this either. Yeah. So so we have more students that we're paying the initial forty three thousand dollars for number one mm -hmm. than we than we projected. And number two, the reimbursement that we're getting for over and above the forty-three thousand mm -hmm. dollars is less than we've gotten in mm -hmm. previous uh, years. In, in previous That's years, right. so it's those those couple of things. Um, in addition to separately, we also have these other expenses that um, are separately. bigger than typical. I believe Dr. McCavanaugh said we had a hundred and two percent increase in our ELL, ELL population. population. Yeah. So, yes. um, <laughs> it's a good so number. all of those all of those things sort of all coming do at the same time. Right. Yep. Recognizing this is a structural deficit that we need to fix, I have a sort of a go-forward question. Do you, have you in the past, we, we have <coughs> used the circuit breaker account to offset other special ed costs to balance the budget. Um, do you recommend that we not do that and just basically leave it there as a safety net? Or? No, so I mean basically what you want to do is you want to line up your appropriation at least to your receivable. Right. So you're, you've appropriated 600,000, you're receiving 370. So, mm -hmm. and so you know right away if you had 300 in the bank, there's your full amount. Right. Okay, so at, the, at a minimum you can only appropriate 300,000 um, so you need at least that to, to match your receivable. You're not in a position yet where you can say, let's do zero and get so we have 
and so we're in a position where we're spending last year's revenue, but maybe you know you inch down that reliance a little bit so that you know for a couple years so that you are spending last year's revenue. We're currently spending this year's revenue, so right. And, and when you said the, the inching down, I, for I think some really valid reasons that have been cost drivers for this, I think we've been inching up over the past few years. And so I think that's just now now we're seeing the right. the unfortunate results of that. So, okay. okay. Thank you. Any other questions? So, um, you know, I just wanted to say that these are all uh, great, uh, you know, ideas and thoughts that you have brought together. So very, very impressed with that. So thank you for doing that, Susan. Thanks. Um, I have one question about grants. Um, is that something that is into consideration that beyond the grants that we currently receive, are there others which we could explore? Um, I mean, I think all the administrators and, and you know, everyone is always exploring grants and, and, and looking for new opportunities. Um, a lot of the grants out there are, are based on the demographics of your community. Um, so if you look at the, the communities, you know, you know, our community and your surrounding um, like districts, we're all getting those same grants because, you know, our, our demographics the communities that are getting beyond is because their demographics are very different than Hopkinton. Um, that's not to say that there are, you know, aren't any grants out there. It's a, it's a matter of exploring, and, and, and I think we do look for those at all, all the time. Great. Thank you again. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think um, next we're, is, did everybody get their questions answered? Okay, so I think next we're going to move into our preliminary uh, capital uh, conversation. So I think we're going to all get a little more cozy. <laughs> so we have Tim Person, who's our Director of Buildings and Grounds, who I think is joining season. us. Um, but in addition, uh, we have two members of Appropriations and um, the Chair of the Board of Selectmen who also are here. So I'd like to invite them up if they want to just hear the presentation, if you have any questions. So just to be clear, we're not voting tonight. This is our first look. Um, but, you know, welcome to, to add your questions to the conversation. There's, I think, There's one, one right more behind chair that behind that desk, yeah. desk yeah. if you want to slide it's that over. Right. And you don't have to come up, but you're very welcome to. That's a nice um, Those chairs are more comfortable. I was Those just chairs thinking they're sacrificing the chairs. So, yeah. They are. So welcome, everybody. And um, does everybody – so we have this – memo in our packet, the capital. Does somebody, I see Rebecca has it, so if I have it. John and Mike don't have it, they can share, right? Yeah. All right. And um, just by what, has everybody met Tim and Susan? Oh, there you yeah. go. Hi, and you Carol, know. I don't even know. <laughs> So, um, so a good thing about you. John, <laughs> John Catino is the chair of the Board of Selectmen. Rebecca Robeck is on the Appropriation Committee, 10-year um, school committee member. Mike Manning is on the Appropriation Committee for how many years? Too many to acknowledge. Lots. Seven years, eight years. Yeah. Um, so Tim Person is our new director of buildings and grounds. Susan, Susan Rothermick is our new um, finance director. And Carol Cavanaugh, if you haven't met her already, is our not new but um, relatively <coughs> recent um, assistant, assistant superintendent. So everybody knows who every, and you know who all the school committee members are, right? Okay. Name yeah. So yeah. now yeah. everybody yeah. knows everybody yeah. and we can all talk about money. <laughs> <laughs> Jump right in. Yeah. It's everybody's favorite subject, and right? And politics, we'll do that after. <laughs> and then religion. And then religion. That's it. <laughs> so um, as we had uh, put in the packet, we're, um, we're presenting for this coming up year, just a one-year capital um, budget. Uh, the reason being, uh, Susan and I both being new to the district, we really want to wrap our arms around um, some of the ongoing uh, issues in the schools and, and figure out really what makes sense to move forward with. So uh, we'll be doing that in this upcoming year and we'll be able to present a 10-year capital plan in our next uh, next spring, uh, next fall in our you know capital meeting. So. Um, <coughs> So I guess I'll, you know, I'll jump right into it. Our first, um, our first item on is the uh, turf field projects. Um, you know, I know that's been discussed. Uh, we had forum last night in town. Um, Gene, you could 
probably speak to it better than I can. Um, but um, we're looking to uh, team up with C CPC to get some funding for this. Um, so we put a placeholder in here of uh, 3.8 million. Tim, I'm sorry. Yep. I just want to make sure our guests understand that this is last year's. So um, we, were, we were trying to do a telephone, pass it on, and I, I saw it didn't get to you. Um, this is here only as a comparison for you. <coughs> Um, as Tim and Susan just explained, that we're looking at a one-year. Um, mm -hmm. But unless your memories are a whole lot better than, than ours are, yep. uh -huh, we wanted you to just be able to just refer to these were things that were on last year's with proposals for this current year, mm -hmm. where you see FY19. We're, this is really just a reference point. It's not what Tim's speaking to right now. Okay. Yep. Right. It, can I just add to that? As you go through, Tim, I can see that there are some new things on here that yeah. were not on before. So if you can okay. just sort of also let us know how you've identified that as part of your, your process going okay. forward. That would be really good, too. Sure. Sure. So I'll move to, um, I think we're all familiar with the turf fields project, um, so I'll move on to the uh, dishwasher for the middle school. So um, as Susan and I came into the district, um, we were looking into uh, changing up some some of our current protocols, and in, uh, in the marathon school we're actually adding a dishwasher in as part <coughs> of that package. And we'd really like to see the district move forward in this way um, in the next couple of years. So the second school we've chosen is the middle school. And the reason why we've chosen the middle school is that it formerly had a dishwasher. So it has uh, a lot of the infrastructure there to be able to hold a, you know, a replacement. Um, some of it may need upgrades, but um, <coughs> we figured it was a good place to start. So I had, um, I had a company come out, and we just did a quick... Um, review of the of the cafeteria and the space for the dishwasher and this was the uh, preliminary budget price that we came up with in order to install a, a dishwasher at the middle school um, inclusive of that would be our silverware trays and a kitchen design we would have to get you know stamp drawings make sure our plumbing is up to code and make some changes inside that kitchen area to accommodate the dishwasher because there were changes made when it came when the old one came out so that's, um, you know, that's the dishwasher. Um, any questions on the, on the dishwasher? Are we saving them for the end? I don't know. How do you guys want to? Why don't, why don't we go through the whole thing and okay. we'll do it at the end. Yeah, All thank right. you, though. Um, and then the third thing on our list here is the Stage 1 Campus Road Master Plan. Um, that's for bus parking, traffic flow, um, and maintenance, and storage. Um, so we actually probably should have started with that other. <laughs> Well, I'd, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of tee this up a little bit. Um, when Tim and I first started, um, right away we, you know, we got into the, the discussion of the traffic flow on campus in anticipation of, uh, you know, a construction project on, on Hayden Row. Traffic so calming. We, traffic calming. Um, so we looked at, you know, how to get, you know, uh, parents and all of our dismissal and everything off of the main roads and, and onto campus. And as we're doing that, we start noticing the constraints within the, the campus a, as a whole. Um, the Loop Road has a section which is a, a one-way because as we're going through with um, the school resource officer, um, you know, he's making suggestions of, well, you know, if we do this, then we should be looking at Hopkins and, and maybe we can be bringing the buses. And one thing led to another, and, and then the charge of, you know, a, a bus parking lot and then a potential of, you know, student parking. So there became a lot of challenges uh, and a lot of information. Um, so what we had, we just kind of pulled back and said, that, you know, we, what we really need to do is look at a master plan for the campus as a whole, mm -hmm. knowing that we're bringing online, you know, uh, the, the fields and, and, and what Tim uh, Kildoff had just spoken about when they ran the cross country meet and there were hundreds of kids and spectators on campus, you know, with all the different athletic events. So I think we need to look at, you know, step back, make a comprehensive view of what the vision is for the, for the whole campus. Um, so later on you'll see is kind of a, uh, an ask to um, provide some money to do that. This would be stage one of what that report is. So that kind of sets that up. <laughs> yep. So, um, so yes. Yeah, so, stage one would be, you know, asking for the funds to do the uh, engineering, you know, the background engineering work to, to see what really makes sense for the campus. Um, well, and then st uh, I guess that's before, prior to stage one. Then stage one would be um, 
starting to make some of those changes to make the campus um, start to function correctly. Uh, we came up with the 320,000 as a placeholder from a previous uh, bid we had gotten for paving, um, you know, paving one of the fields and turning it into a parking area. Um, until we have that engineering drawing, I think that's the kind of the best placeholder we could put we could put in right now. So just to be clear, so the, that includes the engineering plus some of the paving that will happen at the beginning? So th this, the this cost estimate mm -hmm. was the estimate for engineering and paving potential of okay. Field 9. Yeah. So not that that's necessarily what the report is going to be the recommendation mm -hmm. to start. So, but, you know, it seemed to be a good placeholder. And if you look in your 10-year plan, it, that was actually a, a placeholder that was there for parking as well. So mm -hmm. we will have that report when we get further into the agenda. Um, if we move forward with, with um, this, we would have actually what their recommendations would be prior to town meeting. So that number can be a, a more true number, but this would be a placeholder. So then... Um HVAC replacement district wide. Um, so what we did when I first came is we noticed that uh, throughout the district there's a you know a, quite a few HVAC issues. Um, a lot of that has to do with um, with our first go around with this ask is for actually a lot of exhaust fans throughout the district. I think there's uh, six in the middle school, five in five in this school, four or five in Elmwood. I think three in um, Hopkins that we'd like to, to get replaced. That's going to serve us two purposes. It's going to help with the air change through the buildings, which we are currently not getting enough of, and it's also going to help with um, maybe some of the odors in the restrooms. Um, you know, obviously pulling out, you know, pulling out the old air, getting the getting the exchanged air through. So, so that is, um, and then on top of that, we have a couple of other replacements of motors and and such in. The various locations as well. Walk-in refrigerator slash freezer upgrades. So we have um, throughout the district as well. We have some issues with um, the Elmwood School. I'll start there. The Elmwood School refrigeration is um, as old as the building, or well, pretty close to it. So um, what we need to do there is replace the refrigeration lines in the condensing unit on the roof. Um, and that would essentially get us a new refrigerator or freezer. Um, the box is fine, even though it's however old the box is, uh, as long as it, it's structurally it's sound, that doesn't need to be replaced, but we think replacing the refrigeration will, refrigeration unit will get us back up to where we need to be and ensure that we're not going to lose a refrigerator going forward. Currently there are leaks in the center of the coil that's causing it to, to lose the refrigeration. We have some temporary patches on it. We're not sure how long that's going to hold up for. We can't guarantee it'll be another year or, you know, six months. So, um, and then through the schools, middle school needs new doors on the on the freezer. They're um, they're leaking water. There's light. There's water leaking into the light inside. Um, so just some general kind of maintenance and replacement that needs to happen on the on the, all the walking units through the district. Um, AC at the middle school auditorium. So I think this has been on on you guys' list for a couple of years now. Um, just really digging into it and wrapping my arms around it, uh, looking at the quote that you guys, uh, the engineering work they had done on it. Um, I'm still trying to piece together on what they were trying to accomplish. To me, reading the proposal, it looks like they're trying to force fit a system into an existing system. Um, which they did in the middle school office, and it hasn't worked correctly. So I'd really like to take another another kind of go around with this um, to make sure we're putting in the right product or or system, so we're not fighting it, you know, over the lifetime. Um, so that, but I think that number could probably be, you know, pretty close to the same. We'll have to get it uh, again. We'll have to have a company come out and kind of take a, a, a good look at it for us. Um, security upgrades and cameras. Um, so this is, again, through um, 
we're looking at adding 100 cameras, cam, uh, cameras through the high school, middle school, down the, down the, um, to field three at the doghouse at the press box, um, to help ensure that, um, you know, our fields are staying safe and, you know, um, in the off hours. Mm -hmm. And then um, technology upgrades. So uh, the technology upgrades are through, again, district-wide, uh, the MDF rooms where the switches are held. The switches are all um, coming up um, on end of life, 10 years old and over. Um, and we're looking to do upgrades throughout the district for the um, for the server server room, so it's the servers that are starting to uh, t starting to maybe not fail, but again, it'll be an issue coming up. Maybe not today, but in the near future. Hey, Mike, do you have anything to add to? No, and I mean, you know, so the 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 last one, you know, the MDF is kind of um, the beginning of you know, kind of switching out all those core switches. Um, you do that and then you, you move on to the servers and you know so you want to address everything at the end of life um, each one of these switches because it, it really is kind of the main is about 30,000 so four of those for uh, district wide and then you have to add in the you know the electrical and fiber connections in, in addition to that um, so this is kind of that step of starting to get at your uh, infrastructure So as you can see, some of some of what is on here is is new. Um, I think your the the HVAC, uh, the evaluation that Tim did in going through and you know with each of the uh, maintenance workers, building by building, and finding out exactly what wasn't working, and then we brought in an HVAC company who went and looked at some of our major pieces, um, and you know gave a an evaluation of some of the real hot. Uh, button items that need to be addressed and and so you know those are your exhaust fans um, that need to be looked at first and the the refrigeration you know again uh, you know a lot of this is getting old you know you have walk-ins both um, refrigeration and and freezers if they're not holding temp then you you have food loss you have product loss and you're you're transporting food to another school so it can be in their freezer so this is the beginning of what I was talking about in terms of getting the, the kitchens and, and really starting to sink some money in, into them and, mm -hmm. and getting them up to um, up to standard. So those are new. That's not something that you've seen on the 10-year the plan in the past. Um, the security, the technology security upgrades um, for FY19 was um, at, at 300,000. Um, so, but what this is looking at is the 200,000, and again, that's really, it's interior cameras, exterior cameras, and then also continuing on the loop road. And I talked about the MDF um, switches, and that was on the 10-year plan at about 130. So that pricing, so while the, the cameras, the pricing um, went down a little, you know, this one went up a little. So the technology is not new from the from the ten year plan. The air conditioning in the middle school auditorium again is not new. That that's on your ten year plan. So some money was allocated to that at a previous town meeting, um, and it was you know when they did the engineering, it actually uh, came in at uh, the the money that's remaining is not sufficient to complete the project. So. I think on on this plan was about 162,000. We're a little leery of the the engineering report that's defining the cost, which is why we're saying, you know, let's look at this again because basically, even the report is saying you could re-engineer um, existing units. Um, so there's not a lot of confidence. Um, so we'd like to kind of relook at that. So again, that's not a new. Uh, not a new item. Some of the things that were on there for the 10-year plan that we're pushing off is is looking at the building and grounds equipment. You know, give us more time to evaluate and also bring online marathon. Mm -hmm. So once you bring online marathon, what does that mean that we now when we now 
step back and look at all of our equipment district wide. Um, you know, so where does that fit in the next 10 year plan? Um, and Hayden Row campus paving was, uh, was on there. Again, that'll be something that we'll look at in terms of this master plan. You know, what, what are we trying to accomplish, um, you know, for the next 10 years within this campus? And, and you know, paving could potentially become part of that, that staging. All right, so questions? Uh, are the ones in red and black uh, the numbers? Are they in, what's that indicating? I think it's just I think it's just how it came out on the yeah. okay good I think it's just to kind of separate so your eyes aren't you know uh, so you could focus on each line yeah, rather than having to blend together no. the red or all the placeholders though right we want to get a more exact number on some of these so the red ones that we're looking right. at are the we were five of the three yeah. the other, other way around, around. <laughs> I, I think that was an error in the formatting. Yeah. That's okay. nothing to pay attention. Yeah. No alarm. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and on the technology upgrades, when you talk to the servers, do you mean the actual machines, not just the infrastructure? It's the MDF switches. So I, I, won't, be, I won't pretend to be a technology expert, but an MDF switch is, is different than a server. I'm going to have school committee go first, and then I'll move over there. You guys can pick up all of our slack that we have. Anything else, Mina? And, and in terms of uh, priorities, in terms of the needs that you see, uh, can you speak a little bit to that? So you, uh, you looked at all that was out there, and you felt that these are high priority items. So yeah, so we started to evaluate. Um, we really focused on the HVAC system coming up. You know, there's a lot of systems throughout the school, and we felt that. Um, that um, the list that we came up with was the most important things to get done um, first, which is, um, like I said, it's a lot of, it's either motors that haven't run in a couple years and exhaust fans that that um, that either haven't run or, well, none of them have run. You know, the ones that we're replacing, they haven't run in years. So it's, um, we felt as though those were the important items to, to um, get going first, because it will help also assess our balance needs as far as HVAC goes inside the buildings you know if we if our systems aren't running at all it's tough to know what to correct you know so low-hanging fruit is fix the broken stuff right sure, <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know and the other piece to keep in mind is you know your, your exhaust fans um, has a lot to do with your regulation of you know the the air temperature both heat and mm -hmm. cooling um, so you could have something that's constantly calling for heat where there really is not a need for heat, mm -hmm. but it really is coming down to the fact that your exhaust fans are not working properly. So it, you know, regulating the temperature is energy saving. It's, it, it has a lot of mm -hmm. compounding issues, if you will. And on the stage one campus road master plan, did we have, you know, and pardon my ignorance on this, uh, did we not have some funds assigned uh, through the town uh, earlier this year? No? This is brand new. We have been it's talking town, about okay. the bus parking lot, but the, okay. the, for two years now, I think, it, because the town, and it, it has not been, the money has not been allocated yet. It okay. went through the Irvine Tadaro Property Group because we had been talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, putting it over near to the new school originally. Uh, but the other piece about that, which I don't remember the exact number, I know some of you will remember better than I am, but if we put the bus parking in Hopkinton, the town of Hopkinton collects all the excise taxes on those buses okay. rather than the town of Ashland. I see. So that okay. number almost pays for itself in the long run, right? Well, except it, it, over time. This isn't the bus parking lot. This is additional parking for either staff or students it at the high school. It includes the bus parking lot. Oh, it does? Okay. Yep. It does but say not the one, not the one at Irvine Tadaro. Oh, okay. But no, so, Mike, I had asked this to Kathy. Yeah. Am, am I right that we're exploring this instead of the Irvine right. Tadaro property? Correct. Not not to do both. Right. That's it. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Okay. That's what I'm, yeah. It's, <coughs> it's part of the master plan um, exploration. So it's looking at all of the things that have been problematic it includes also as you 
would note on the 10-year plan that we've been talking about in maintenance storage mm -hmm. forever. Okay. So it includes that. Um, it's looking at all of these little pieces and having the vision to think about. And the problems that you've heard me talking along with, with Alan and with Evan and with Phil um, about the campus and the increased parking and the traffic flow, it just feels like it's time to take a look at what was <laughs> used by many fewer people you know, when it was first designed. And um, again, some fresh eyes looking at it. Um, Inefficient, I think. looking yeah. at it all at once, I think. I, I really some opportunities. And then, like you know, the, the potential for a turf field there. And what's that going to mean for additional need for parking? Just all of the things that could coordinate in, in a really positive way. So, so since we're at the forefront of this, I mm -hmm. would just say structurally that, you know, we have been fairly successful in having a consistent request for technology as well as safety and security upgrades year over year so it's easier for the town to predict and easier for us to manage and I think that structure has worked really well so after we sort of get through the overview and the vision if we can look to set up you know sort of a consistent expenditure over a certain period of years that implements you know I, I see this says stage one so implements in different stages that's just been a really good, mm -hmm, I think, mm -hmm. um, structure that has worked well from the town. So I just mm -hmm. would offer that in terms of mapping it all out once we get the, the big picture. So just to clarify, Jean, what your expectation is around that. So as we all know, this is a preliminary uh, report. Would you hope that in the final capital proposal that there was a better vision or a better explanation of what, what the total ask is? Right, and I As think what relates. I heard Susan say is, you know, we'll really even get down to the detail of when are we going to have to do whatever portion of the loop road that comes up every once in yeah. a while, and that's always yeah. a point of contention in town. Right. So I think um, what I what I'm hearing all of you say is is really great, and I think it's exactly what the town and the new charter are asking for too, which is a really much better defined look at what is ahead in the next 10 years and I know once you get out pretty far it's a little bit grayer mm -hmm. but okay. um, just we've had an opportunity for sort of fresh set of eyes and and new way of looking at things and so this has been a great I think start to to a more informed projection going forward so okay. can but I ask a related question um, how many buses do we have 26 27 27 all right Thank you. That's all. Oh, <laughs> move on. Any other that was <laughs> easy. I have to think about this a little bit more. I'll be, I'll, I'll be back. Any other questions? I have a couple um, about the security camera um, article. I think you did say it does cover the whole loop road, right? So all of the fields. Um, I would just, again, and I know you're going to tell me, Susan, that the money is the money and it all comes from the same place, but I do think in terms of um, a portion of that article, I would really love to see it be jointly sponsored between the police um, and the schools because so much of what's been happening on our campus has been happening off school hours and this is a tool that the police really need as well as the schools in terms of monitoring for safety but also as a preventative but f also as sort of a, a tool for follow-up if there is an incident so um, hopefully that's a conversation that we could have with the town I, again it all comes from the same pocket but I just think in terms of a statement of support and um, a recognition that the police also have this need, I, I would think that that would be um, a good conversation to have. Well, and Jean, to add, to add on to that, the, the capability of the, the cameras as well, what, during the marathon, as a for instance, there is a follow-on where the, um, you know, the police <coughs> or, exactly. you know, the enforcement agencies can roll from our cameras, you know, from Hopkinton to the next town, to the next town, to the next town. So it's not just, you know, that there that. is that interconnection um, mm -hmm. because we have put in similar systems that they can, you know, continue that feed, Excellent. you know, following. So it is something that, that could be some more supported not only from our local law enforcement, but, you know, just in a, a you know, a larger vision of, mm -hmm. of security. For Various towns. Yep, that's an excellent point. I had not thought about that at all. Um, all right, unless the rest of you have additional questions, I'm going to turn it over to our town partners, but I'm going to start by posing a question to you. 
um, which is that at our joint meeting in September, we did talk about how we were really going to just take a one-year look this year at Capitol. I don't know. Raise your hand if you remember that, <laughs> um, or if you were caught by surprise. What I'm what I'm trying to make sure that we do um, is that when when this information comes to all of you, we all have that understanding. So if there's a different format and we sort of gray out this, but you still get to see it for context or whatever, I just want to make sure that the way that we present it to you is going to be successful for all of you plus plus your partners so that the initial thing isn't going to be why are the schools only doing this when everyone else is doing why so that's kind of my kickoff question to you and then whatever questions that you, that you have that you want us to consider before next week or our next meeting would be great so go ahead I have just one question a clarification question on the um, money for the dishwasher mm -hmm. you mentioned that there's some work that's going to need to be done to the actual location yes uh, is that part of the money that you've quoted here yes okay, great. Yep. thank you and uh, my question was the the uh, building ground storage facility it, it actually sort of got answered with and, and the paving um, for the for the new new car parking and the bus parking before we had them split out and it was going to be at Irving to Darrow um, so so is everybody to Darrow out in this new one in we're not there yet oh okay, okay we're not just... even close um, okay. we we want to do design first we want to explore certainly there's been some preliminary discussion when we were looking at the uh, traffic calming about there could potentially be a place for buses and that got us thinking about if we were to have additional places to put for example if we were to park buses behind the middle school where would we put all the people who are currently parking in the middle school if we start building more space for car parking does that give us an opportunity for bus parking and loading in a very safe way so we're thinking about parking we're thinking about efficient loading um, and providing all of this information to the school committee for their consideration um, and to the Tadaro Irvine Tadaro a committee on which Nancy sits um, but but we are nowhere near being able to say that this would be our recommendation over that quite yet and, and my other one when it comes to the uh, storage of uh, facilities when we were building the DPW facility one of the, the, the things that I asked for them was to make sure that there was enough room for off-season um, uh, school building and grounds um, equipment to be able to park there mm -hmm. and they assured me and I just went and did a tour of it the other day that there is indeed room so that we do have places to put because I remember that was something that happened uh, 10 years ago we used to have the tractors that were just sitting outside and mm -hmm. before things were getting beat up so John if I could begin and then I'll, I'll defer to, to Tim only because he wasn't here when that conversation was happening and I was um, when that conversation was happening we responded we were asked to give measurements of all of our equipment and we provided all of the measurements um, but we also provided information about the things that it wouldn't be practical to store, mm -hmm. right. right? And then so, so the blades, for example, like driving, getting them there and then getting them back. And that would probably be actually a good example of something that we could store elsewhere because they are in the way, yep. you know, all summer, spring, whatever. That would be a great example of something that we would store. But then similarly, there were enough other things that we would just need access to on an ongoing basis that it wouldn't make sense to store so although we provided the information for all of our equipment which we were asked to do um, there was also some discussion Tim and I don't know if you uh, if there are things that come to mind that it wouldn't be practical um, well I mean even the tractors for instance we use them we'll use them summer and winter we're going to change the tires out we're going to use them to be able to you know kind of load snow get you know clear out the parking spaces um, why I think we need a more central location is that we have them, you know, I have a couple down at the doghouse and I have a couple under the middle school and, and uh, just, uh, it's not hard to keep track of them, but it's, you know, it's, it's not the best, it's not the best solution, I think, for, mm -hmm. the, for the problem that we have. Um, I agree, I think the plows could be off-site, snow blowers, things like that, it's very seasonal, very seasonal things, lawn mowers and the, you know, if they have that, that type of thing, but, um, Again, that would be that would be you know seasonal and 
And um, I think having them having a central storage space here because we like to maintain, we try to maintain the equipment throughout the winter as well. So when the lawnmowers come off line from being run, now we're doing the cleanup on them, getting them ready for the next season. And we may not do that all in you know one week and then be able to store them. You know, as we're taking care of the insides of the buildings and kind of the downtime from that, they'll go they'll go out and kind of continue on maintenance of the equipment throughout the you know throughout the winter. Great, thank you very much. But in no way are we talking about a building in any any size comparison. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this would be just unless a, you guys agree to it, uh, right? <laughs> and then tell us a place to put it. That's right. Yeah. yeah. But. yeah that, 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 that was that was actually part of it, you know. Yeah. But then again, we still do have Irvine to Daru also, and and the and, and the, the expansion for the for all of the uh, school uh, necessities. Yep. So. But that's all I've got right now. Yeah, I just had a couple of questions, and one was a follow-on to John Catino's question about, you know, the proposal or for the uh, <coughs> the campus roadmaster plan. Um, when you say you're still thinking it, about it and working it out, is that what you're going to use the three hundred and twenty thousand for, or are you going to come up with think it out before it goes to town meeting? Yes, um, Susan, I'll defer to you. There's a, there's an item later on the agenda. Um, uh, item E, Campus Road Master Plan Design. Um, can you, even though we're not y there yet, can you describe the purpose of that agenda item? So basically what we're looking to do this year, and we'll be asking the school committee in, in a few minutes, is to actually appropriate the money to, to do that study now um, and come up with a master plan, keeping in mind all the things that we need to accomplish. Student park and parking, parent parking, staff parking, bus parking, um, increased uh, use for all, all the fields uh, for events. Um, the, the, one of the biggest challenges that, that we have, of course, is, is dismissal. Um, so where to put the buses for dismissal? Just to give you a, a, an example, we're only loading about six buses at a time down at Hopkins because of the configuration of how they design that parking lot. That I would recommend would be one of the first things that get changed because idea there's 21 buses and you know timing of loading buses and getting them off is extremely challenging because you're going from the high school, middle school to Hopkins to elementary and five minutes delay um, is five more minutes at, at each school. So there's a, there are a lot of moving pieces to really looking at this campus and, and getting the full thing together and, and what makes the most efficient sense. So that 320 is kind of a placeholder of they may put together stages of recommendations. So, you know, depending on what their full vision comes out when they put together this, um, this plan, you know, their plan doing it now will define a little bit better for the school committee as we get closer to town meeting what exactly that 320 would do or maybe that number is different okay it's good to have that planning beforehand because mm -hmm. as we're all under the impression that this was going to be a great idea for the irvine property and you're potentially switching it so you the details will be important but, but why, that, why it, you know so when we say bus parking it, they may say bus parking doesn't make sense here Right. So we, do, we don't know because there are a lot of issues that need to be addressed campus-wide. Okay, thank you. The second question is about the uh, dishwasher. Um, I take it there hasn't been one there for a while, or is it one that just recently broke, or why now and are there cost reasons that it makes sense to have one versus what you're doing today? Uh, so I'll speak to that a little bit. Um, we approached the... the um, elementary building committee with this uh, for marathon school. So currently all the schools are using styrofoam trays and so district wide that's 186,000 trays that we are throwing away um, you know for for the year. So it, it's a lot of different things. It's you know we're, we're for one for the marathon school we're, we're building a lead school yet we were committing to a lifetime of, you know, throwing and increasing our um, trash volume. 
So they rethought that and they agreed that it made more sense to put the dishwasher in at Marathon. Knowing that we had the dishwasher at uh, the middle school, this would be a, a, a nut, another step to pull back on, on those trays. There is a cost to those trays. There is a cost to the, the trash for that. There is a cost to water for a dishwasher, you know, so there's efficiency to dishwashers, you know, so the, it's kind of continuing on with that conversation of, you know, trying to reduce those, those styrofoam trays. They've committed to that to the marathon. The middle school would be the next logical step if we're going to continue in, in this process because they did have one. And it has been a while since it's been removed. Okay. And just as you go to, towards town meeting, I suggest you do have the numbers to say, you know, you're paying 75000 plus the water and compared to the trays. And I know styrofoam was bad, but where I work, we have cardboard trays, which are paper, not, you know. So I, it's just, it makes economic sense. Yep. There yep. is an important piece of it. Yep. Will there be an additional cost for trays that aren't disposable if you're going to get rid of the styrofoam trays? And is that part of the 75000 Right. So, so the seventy-five thousand includes buying the the, the um, trays that are reusable, and cutlery. Uh, we talked about cutlery as well, uh, yeah. forks and spoons. So. Yeah, I just have one more follow-up on the bus parking. One of the things that we were hoping to get on the warrant this year was to put a placeholder so that we could start um, the construction of bus parking so that we could start saving that 112 k and then and and actually have it as part of the negotiating with for the bus contract mm -hmm. so one of the things th that if we start to look into uh, even though it's great to have a master plan um, to maybe at least put money aside to build one somewhere as quickly as possible to uh, start taking advantage of it on, on two levels so I, I'm going to speak a little bit to the um, number that was quoted on the previous. Um, when the bus contract existed, um, our cost for fuel in what in the contract was at about four dollars, and the actual cost for fuel ran at about two dollars. So we were gaining from that because the fuel clause we were always on the on the positive side so th that's where um, that number was driven from well the cost for fuel now as you know is is down in the in the two dollar range so for me to put um, a fuel clause in this bid right now is actually not advantageous because we're really more now at the floor whereas in the other bid we were at the ceiling um, so if I put the fuel clause in, in this bid, it will most likely, the um, price for fuel going forward most likely is not going down any further and will only go up and will escalate. So the cost to the district will actually be higher. So I will not be putting a, a fuel clause into the contract. So the mileage piece and everything else that went into that calculation um, don't work for this next bid. But I think John's talking the about the excise tax. taxes. Though. The excise that tax. Excise tax, yes. Right. But part of that number that's in there um, was a savings due to changing the mileage and the fuel and everything else. So that number that's on that 10-year plan may not translate is what I'm saying. Susan, we have – It's a caution. Uh, if I recall correctly, when we actually did the last transportation – at least the last one, <laughs> we – had clauses in there that were the, the fuel and mileage piece, but were general clauses, mm -hmm. or at least in the bid, around if we got a bus parking right. lot in town that they would would and could accommodate parking the, the buses on site. So, the, so, so there will still be a clause right. that if we have um, bus parking within town, they will be required to register their buses in Hopkinton, and we will gain the excise tax. Right, and that I think that's will, what that your will concern be is, right? I just want to make sure yeah. that we have that. So that, that will, so we don't need it. We don't need the. We don't need a. We don't need the okay. pavement for the leverage on the bid. We'll have that in the, in the in the contract. That's as correct. Right. Yep. Yep. Thanks, John. Okay. Any other questions? Mm -hmm. All right. Congratulations, you survived your first round. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. My only question that's left for me is the formatting. So yeah. do you think it's important 
in terms of what people are expecting that the formatting remain. Is this the way other departments present it? Is so this we, what appropriations? We do we do have the the format that the that the town okay. Uh, okay. is looking for. So okay. we Perfect. we will use the town's forms. You will see it in a way in which you're used to seeing it then. I just want to make sure we don't get to the end and have people be upset that they aren't seeing what they think they're going to see. Yeah, good point. That's all. Um, well, thank you all. You're more than welcome. We have many more things to discuss if you'd like to stay, but I don't expect you to. <laughs> so thank you for coming. Um, you know, I think we really, really do want this to be a much more collaborative process this year, so we really appreciate your time. I know it's late and you all work and have long And are weeks. they getting our documents in advance of the meeting? Um, I don't believe... Other than I happened to give this to Rebecca, I don't know if any of you, we didn't send them to you, it was no. in the packet. So let's start um, a if practice we, of, and also Brian Her is our liaison, so yep. we'll start a practice of sending our budget documents in to, um, to the three of you, plus Brian, plus Norman. So and you're Chris. looking at Sue, but I'll make sure that yeah. it is. Okay, so I'll we'll make sure you get the advance. Thank you, good advance night. Thank you, good night. Thank you guys very much. Okay, so now. We are on item A under new business, the clear gov vote. So um, we've already had the presentation. I just. Uh, I have one question yes. on clear gov. Were there other, um, you know, clearly they are local mm -hmm. to Hopkinton, but were other uh, competitors considered? Actually, John, do you, do you want to stay for this clear gov part? because I think you have the information from the town. Mina ha just asked a question I don't know the answer to, so. You almost made it to the door. Come? Yeah, <laughs> narrow, narrow <laughs> mess. <laughs> Sorry. So beside, yeah, I'll let you sit first. Besides Clear Gov, uh, were there other companies that you had considered? Yeah, as a matter of fact, we're running the, another one in tandem. One, uh, one um, caused us to actually code all the all the data ourselves, and um, uh, it, it was just different than it, it just it didn't give us the comparisons to some of the other towns in, in the way that the uh, that uh, many of the members of the board of selectmen wanted to see it, and we thought it would be much easier for the for the um, citizens to see. I see, and and so it has been piloted right now. It's under works. Yes, there, there. We're coming up to speed right now. With both of them, I just was wondering what the other one was, just for comparison. Oh, the other, one, oh. yeah, the other one, yeah, the other one they had started earlier in the okay. year, and Same and Clear Gov they have just started in the last month, I okay. believe. But they're not going to continue with the likely with both. Well, one of the one Choose of them is one of them is more used in house. Okay. Okay. They gotcha. were just using yeah. it, and and uh, and the Clear Gov was was you know it, it's uh, you know the way I see it is more of a, a marketing tool. That uh, to show uh, in, in the town in comparison to other towns uh, of, of really how well we're run, mm -hmm. and um, as, as, I, as John and I were talking about the other day, um, you know, it didn't, it really didn't come to light until it, at the town meeting when you, it, when school committee put up the, the the slide showing us in comparison to other towns of of how um, how well we're doing as as price per student. And, and you know the bang for bang for the buck. I, mean, I know when I was when I was uh, visiting colleges last year with my uh, with my daughter, that was one of the main things that many of the campuses were coming up with, is you know the, the value of the education for each of the schools, and you know the value of the education that we, that that, that the uh, students are getting here in Hopkinton. It's, it it showed right there, um, and so we're trying to do the same thing with the with the town budget. And, and you know, because you know, just last year, one of the sm a very small thing that um, John Westerling did was uh, eliminate uh, sand and just use just use a, a, a um, treated salt, and um, it ended up that uh, our roads were a lot cleaner, and we ended up saving a fortune in, in sweeping, and we were much we were um, ready for the marathon a lot sooner. And so it's just a small thing, but we saved you know tens of thousands of dollars just right there. And just one additional question on that. So the yeah, data yeah, entry part, there is enough. nothing, I don't know if you would know it, um, that the data entry is not being done by anybody on, right. on the Right, they do all the data entry, but that's but one of the things that, that okay. I wanted to clarify was that, and Jean brought it up, is that some of the things 
that look like they're in your budget are actually carried over in the town budget, and it just it, it makes every it just gives it a, a true look for uh, the way that town runs because you guys run it a lot leaner than that. And that may that may actually already be accounted accounted right. for in the Desi stuff, so we would have to actually ask that question. Right. But yeah. so okay, so for for our decision that's in front of us now, again, just to recap, we have basically three choices. We can. I'm sorry, no, we have four because Brian added one in at the end. We can claim the free site, um, and that does turn on things like the per pupil expenditure, which we did our own slide on, but the, it's a very nice looking slide that they have. We can um, buy it now at the invoice price that's in your packet, or as Brian presented um, at the end, we could buy 20 months now, which would be the, I think, probably. 80% of the lower invoice price plus then a year follow-on starting so we would add that to FY19 budget or we could do no money in the FY18 budget and budget for it in FY19 so um, I guess what's important and, and I'll let Susan I guess just nod but we don't have a funding source for this at this point um, and even though it's a small amount of money, I think the, the critical conversation, why I wanted to wait until after we had the conversation um, around all of the changes to the budget for FY18 is I just wanted to make sure we had full information and context um, about, and I'm not sure you gave us the um, dollar amount of our deficit, but I don't want to say the wrong Well, numbers. I mean, we're, we're still continuing to go through budgets, so. Yeah. You know we're we're not we're not there yet, so we're not, we're not completed. But you know, it, but it's as, quite substantial. As as it is in any district, um, the beginning is is a struggle. Yeah. So basically, the tra the trade off, even though it's a small amount of money, is there's that because we don't have a funding source identified right now, it's that much less money that we would eventually recap in our end of year balances that we pay towards our special education tuition, and that is where our critical. Um, adjustment is going to be needed um, so I just wanted to make sure that we were very mindful of that in making this decision um, because we are in such an unusual circumstance with our special education costs so that said I'm going to stop talking and let you all just start the discussion about what your preferences are and then we're going to have to craft our own motion based on what the decision is so and do you think we would use the deeper <coughs> information if not having went through a budget process yet, the deeper information that is provided in the paid version of this website, would we use that in our budget process or do we have access to everything we need already? Is this more for the general public to get the information about the, the district? I mean, I feel like that's really a question for the three of you. If, if you feel like the back end part of it would add value to the process that you're going through, that's what, that's what your question is. Yeah. I mean, is it would it be for us or is it for information for the general population? The reason I ask, I guess, is because I did look a lot at this website. I looked for competitors. I thought this was a really cool visual presentation of information. But I don't know that it necessarily has to be deeper than what's offered as the free version for folks in the community. I, I, I'm sure there are a handful of folks who might want to go a little deeper, but in, in general, I don't know that a community member would want all of that deep, deep information about the district. We might want it, but if we have it available to us already, then why would we pay for it, is my question. I mean, I'm, I'm looking a little bit to Susan on this. I, I guess one thing I'd like the school committee to understand is that the timing on this for us is a little, little out of order. And the reason we're bringing it now and then saying we don't have a funding source um, is that I've actually been talking with Chris, uh, Brian's partner, for almost, almost a year now, for a while. Um, I guess whenever Brian was talking about first launching, Chris is from town, came to present to Myself as well as, I mean, Ralph was here at the time, Ashok was, at, was there as the uh, technology director. And the, the feeling at that point was, I don't want to be on a different platform than the town. I don't want the people, people who are looking on the websites to be navigating, you know, you get used to navigating one site and then seeing something that looks very different on the town side. Um, 
and and so it felt I I was kind of waiting mm -hmm. on what the town was going. That too, and that's why that that's why we both. I'm sorry. For, that's Fine. why we pulled the trigger. Yeah, right. And so I think um, the town the town has made a decision, as John shared, um, really felt that this this particular platform had much to offer above and beyond the one that they already were using. Um, and it puts us in this position of it would be great to be on, at, on the same platform with the town. Um, my interest, part of my interest had been how would we use this for budget planning? And Sue, having used it, because they use Sudbury as an example, Brian used Sudbury as an example, um, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I don't, don't, I don't know how you feel about that. Um, so Sud Sudbury, the school doing it is, is new. So the town was, was doing it while I was in that district. And there were things that the uh, town manager, as you can see, the town manager is very active on, on that site. And there are things that she can do on the town site level that gave a lot of information about the school. Mm -hmm. um, so so there, are, there are things, because you can go in, as, as he showed you, that, that dashboard. Um, and I think she's more she's more active on than you know maybe some of the other communities. So the school using it is, is new, so we didn't use it. I, w I will say. Um, so the information does come from the from the Desi site. Um, questions that we were posed uh, at town meeting um, from from the community came from them going to the Desi site. So on the Desi site it says X. Uh, you know so. It's really a sense of what your community, you know, is bringing to you, and what is your community bringing to town meeting as as being their questions. Um, transparency, of course, is is one of those words that everybody just uses. Doesn't mean that you're doing it, not doing it. It's just a you know, it's just one of those plug words that everybody uses. This will increase transparency, so everybody, you know, well, well of course we'd want to do that but there isn't necessarily something saying that you're not being transparent. So you have to kind of gauge that with, you know your public better at this yeah. point in time. Um, I, you know, I'm not, I'm not there yet. We haven't used it in the budget process. And even looking at, um, so the school piece comes off of the end of year report, which we will file at the end of October. Um, and he's saying that we can upload our end of year report directly to him in addition to DESI so that that 2017 information is on the site sooner uh, to you know give you that um, information sooner. So, but that still gives you 2017, but we're creating the 2019 budget. So, I mean, there's just a couple things to, to keep in mind. But, but again, you, you know your public, you know what they're asking you, um, and is is this value added? Mm -hmm. And so, um, and and I'm not going to put Carol on the spot because she hasn't had a chance other than the presentation tonight. Um, similarly, uh, Carol gets an extreme number amount of information um, from things that are available. Did you want to pull this up? Did um, you? I can show it if people would like to see it. But um, the state has recently released information they call it radar reports for each district um, they are free they come into um, the drop box and you just pull them out and there is an enormous amount of data there uh, radar stands for resource allocation and district action reports and so they will do um, all kinds of special education enrollment they'll do comparison reports they'll do staffing comparisons so for example one report might tell us how many special educators we have per 100 students versus any other community that we decide to put in there. So one of my very first slides, which I've shared with the administrative team in the district, is um, a comparison report that would help us to see uh, things like um, the total enrollment that we have, our per pupil expenditure, our percentage of students with disabilities, our percentage of students who are L's, our MCAS, ELA, and science, and all of that goes across. And then going down the left-hand side, we can compare ourselves to Holliston, Medfield, Needham, Sharon, Walpole, Wayland, Wellesley, Westford, Winchester, and Neshoba. Those are the ones that they give us as our like districts. We can take those out and plug in different districts if we are curious about them. So a lot of that data that Desi is giving 
um, out through ClearGov, you know, we have access to through radar as well. And it actually produces a, I, I think, a pretty aesthetically pleasing report. So. So the question, oh, sorry, Nancy. I, I'm sorry. Is that, is there a way that it, during the budget time that we could put some of that information out onto our website for people to of use? Course. Yeah, sure. Yes. You're going to be hearing, you're going to get a little glimpse of this in a couple of weeks. Couple we weeks. cannot wait for you to show up at that meeting. I feel like it's network TV. Mm -hmm. You're leaving the cliffhangers for meetings <laughs> to come. It actually is, you know, a very good tool mm -hmm. and easy to work with. Yeah, I certainly saw it as an analytics tool that it's built on top of the data to report and you can slice and dice as you please. Um, uh, you know, Jean, you mentioned gave a few options, right? So I don't see any harm in having the free option, right? Um, I don't know if it requires what it requires of us to go and claim it. I don't know what that would mean. And if that helps the town at least to have some basic information, it doesn't hurt, right? I think for me, and I, I just want to weigh in on it because I think that there are certainly compelling parts to, and, and, and I've spoken with my colleagues in other districts, other superintendents in terms of um, the tool um, around transparency, the kinds of things that um, Carol will be providing up to you and, and provides to administration clearly is out there, maybe is something that needs to be interpreted um, for folks. Mm -hmm. um, so there's there's definitely a place for ClearGov on top of all of these other tools that we're talking about. So my question was twofold. twofold. One was, would we use it for budget planning purposes? Probably not so much because we're not as much comparing ourselves to other districts unless we're trying to say, you know, here's a comparison in terms of what we're spending for special education. That's good information to have. But we still, our primary focus on our budget planning is what do our kids need? Mm -hmm. And we're going to come to you with whatever that is, no matter what everybody else is doing. Um, so I, I think as a budget planning tool, maybe not so much, but as a place of sharing information, I loved the slices of the pie. Mm -hmm. And I love to be able to go in, and he didn't have a lot of time, but he spent a little bit more time with us, and I've spoken to other, other uh, superintendents about how they use it. it. It does provide you with a lot of really intriguing information um, that you might not have thought of considering as well. Um, so I, th I, I definitely feel like there's a place for it. The unfortunate thing is around the timing for us. With everything else that we've had to come and ask you for, um, it, and it, although it may not seem like a lot in the, in the scheme of things, had we been planning for it, I think it would have been part of our technology budget. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not to say that if we, if we start to play with it a little bit, once the town launches and there's a school component to the town piece, we play with what we're able to um, claim um, from the other, the, f the free side of this, get people used to what it looks like, and then consider as part of our budget planning that we're going through right now, um, being part of it, signing on for it is, is something that I, I would propose because I do think that there are some additional pieces that this can offer that, that some of these other resources, um, particularly for the community view and providing it communication Mina I agree I mean I think um, well I think it's a no-brainer to claim the free so that that's turned on particularly because the town is is um, is engaging I think that I can confidently say that if as the town is turning it on um, if there's additional information from the schools that bolsters the information that's available on the town site of course we're gonna share that with them um, I think in terms of an internal tool what was really compelling to me is what Susan just said, which is in terms of analytics, it's even if you're aggressive about forwarding them the data before they would normally get it, it's still at least a year behind. So that's not necessarily a great projection tool. Um, and I think that you already have other resources in-house for your work, which doesn't have mm -hmm. to makes less difference if it looks the same as the way the town is presenting information. I think in terms of presentation um, to people in the public, consistency is great because it makes it much easier for them, just much more easily accessible on all fronts. Um, I think if it were a different year and we didn't have the combined effect of a critical deficit in our special education budget um, combined with 
the complete reset of MCAS, which is just going to be very confusing for people. I, I feel like because there's an option to turn it on for free, I would absolutely like to do that, and I would like to really see how the community responds to it. They get a little bit of it, maybe deeper dive on the town side, and we can use that as part of our decision-making process. I'd be, I would be um, really interested in hearing about adding it to our technology budget, but I feel like the one person that we haven't really invited to the table is Ashok at this point, so I don't want to. <laughs> oh, he's I, watching, though. <laughs> but, because, but because he would be taking a hit on it, I don't feel like it's fair to make that promise um, without him right now. So. That's sort of where I am. I don't know what everybody else is. Just, because I, I'm, I'm similar where you are. We have the free option. We're not in a position where we've budgeted for this. We're facing a, a structural deficit of a number we don't know exactly what it is yet. But it's a lot more than $7,500. Um, so I, I, and, and the other piece, and I did ask a bit of a question about this, is the idea I think this could be a really valuable tool for community members to use who want to get more detailed information about how these budgets are constructed and what's underneath them. I, I'm just not sure they're going to use it. And, and, and that's, that's where I struggle to spend $7,500 when we can turn it on for free and find out. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that, t so to me, if we, if we turn it on for free tomorrow, we, if, if in two months we find out as we start our budgeting process that people are going to this website all the time to try to mine for information and want more, I'm pretty sure he'd write us a contract that would start on December 1st. Mm -hmm. And we'd be in the exact same position we are right now. Right. So uh, to me, I, I think the no-brainer is turn it on for free and, and let's see how it uses. The only thing that would have potentially tipped it the other way for me is if I had heard that we could potentially use it in this year's budgeting cycle internally and it doesn't sound like there's much appetite for that because a it's old data b we keep talking about how it's data they get from desi actually technically it's data they get from us because we give it to desi and then they pull it from desi so it's 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 a it's re um it's reformatted information that we've provided and so i i, I that's I, I think we turn it on for free and then we just see what the activity is like I have yeah. one request. Sorry, so if, if, if I may, through the chair, um, one of the one of the reasons why the timing for the town to bring it in now was we were hoping to to take advantage of of loading in our our, our um, new budget data, so that so that when we're t when we're doing the budget talk, so we can bring up the screens and actually show it, and so when we come to town meeting, we have all that new budget data. On there, so we were hoping to, to actually start utilizing it. That, that was that was our time. That well, we had actually started talking to them about it several months ago, mm -hmm. and and so now we're just coming in. So we we're just trying to get it ready, really use it um, as a, on the board of selectmen to uh, set up this year's budget. So mm -hmm. this might be an inappropriate way for me to say this, but basically we now have the opportunity to copy off your homework. Right? To see how you... No, how you that was very inappropriate. And, uh, not that I would ever recommend <laughs> the high school to ever do that. But so, so I mean, I, I think that's great. So we have the opportunity to see how you're able to use it um, and and how that and It's all new for us, too. You know, exactly. But, I, but it, you know, it, it's, it's... And we, you know, we're talking about transparency, but it's more of a communication tool. Absolutely. And it's, and it's an internal communication tool, too. So that because, you know, when we, you know, um, when we get the, those sheets... You know, and and you've got to you've got to mine it. You've got to mine down, and 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 to be able to change things dynamically, you know, if, if you know, just changing a couple percentages and watching all the graphs change, mm -hmm. you know, in real time, as opposed to taking notes and then asking, you know, Chris or somebody else to change these numbers for us at the next meeting, you know, bring out the bring out all those sheets, and that's why and that's why we we pushed hard for it on the board of selectmen. All right, so I, I think, am I ready for a motion? So okay. one thing, just a word of caution, um, <coughs> having worked extensively on analytic tools, reporting, and data, um, you know, while it might all seem it's just data feeds coming in from DESI, all your reports are based on the sanctity of the data, and as data moves from one place to the other, there are so many chances for error. And we are not reviewing it, so we must make that disclaimer that this data has not been reviewed by us. Mm -hmm. Right, because if there is an error, we are we are not owning that. That's your point. Go ahead. I think for me, I, 
and that is something I hadn't thought of, but the bottom line, I think, for me is that we have had a number of unanticipated costs, including new hires we've had to make, and tapping in yeah. with some of the special education. I, I, I don't dispute what a great tool it is. I, I was, I like the way the graphics are presented, but I am concerned with continuing to whittle away at by the time we get any other in, unanticipated needs that come forward, we're still in October. We right. have to make it through to the end. Be no so I'm going to I'm going to make a stab at this. Okay. Okay. I think that what I'm hearing is a motion to claim the free version of um, ClearGov, the ClearGov platform, and to continue to work with the town to monitor um, utility and usage and consider the addition of, um, of ClearGov in the FY19 budget. Does that sound like a fair restatement of? Uh, I'd be willing to make that motion. Yeah. Okay. I didn't write it down, so um, hopefully that was on TV. So if we're not. That? I'm just wondering if we need a motion if we're not making a well, business claim decision. Well, the claim that do we have to do anything claim to claim? I mean, claim, actually, that's claim. a good point. It, we're claiming it. the free one. I, I, oh, I, I right, think yeah, Kathy totally could probably have done that without talking to us. Like, I, I'm just thinking it's yeah. not really business. It was going yeah. to be. It right. was a TBD in case yeah. we had decided to contract. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a good point. Clear <coughs> but it so feels then, like now it's not so much a motion. Just by consensus. So by by general consensus, the school committee is supportive of claiming. The uh, free clear glove platform and is looking forward to monitoring the level of usage of that platform and working with our partners at the Board of Selectmen um, on consistency and utility as well as considering it for the FY19 budget. End of story. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, John, very Thank much you, for Thanks staying so, so late. Long. We appreciate it's it. I know it's a long day for you. Jean, does it, Jean comes to our meeting. That can be really boring. <laughs> Um, Have a good night. Thank, thank you. you. Okay, so I think we can probably pick up a little steam here. We're up to school committee policy ILBA protection of pupil rights amendments first reading. So, so um, just going to quickly do this, Mina, because you weren't here, and this is for you um, because you, you weren't feeling well at our, our last meeting. Um, just to um, remind the school committee that we have a working group. Um, that has gone through um, Jen and Nancy and I um, and what we've tried to do is go through and, and pro provide efficiencies around policy review um, and so for this is a good example of the first one that really is the only reason we have it on is because there was contact information that is outdated and so for some of the policy it's <laughs> Right. And John, um, we do have to your question last time about do you even need to vote some of these things? Like if it's just, there is a question out there that we are, we are looking into. Um, so I don't have the answer to it yet, but there will be, there will, for example, um, students for replacing all references to children to students, that kind of thing. Um, but this one th is very simple and straightforward. Um, and other, in other cases, you will get a very clear recommendation from the working group, which you may or may not want to take as a recommendation. But so we, sh we should be able to move through them pretty quickly. So for tonight's, um, the first one is, yeah, is just really, we had some outdated contact information. It's redlined in your, um, in your policy. And that is the only change unless Jen and Nancy. I just caught one thing. One child. Oh. Reference. Oh, I actually didn't catch that, but in it's, the first sentence, oh. this should say federal law. Oh, well, then I am wrong. Just a minute, because my my trusty assistant superintendent right beside me, Jean, found two more. Oh. Yes, she did. So we Human. have. Yes. <laughs> first, she gets. She usually catches them all. So on the first line, a federal lay should say should read law. Mm -hmm. Oh. Under B, I'm sorry, I thought this was that a different was the one, one I got. B two, so first line, under B number two, any non-emergency invasive physical exam or screening this should see should be that, and then under D notice of rights third line should read as any instead of and, so we'll provide updates within a reasonable time period after any substantive changes. 
Wow. Thank you, Ms. Birchman, Dr. Dr. Kavanaugh. Dr. Kavanaugh. Nice. Very very I, do, I read it over in <laughs> with, with us. I, okay. I'm, I'm, <laughs> we're going to do better in November. <laughs> How many uh, there was there's on the one table. more. It, oh, the, no. No, just the child uh, thing, because uh, we hadn't discussed yes, that correct. Okay. prior to the last meeting we had. I, I mean, the sub activities. notice of activity is the last sentence there that says opportunity to opt a child out of activities. We want that to say student. student. Well, you have to show us where we are, Gina. So, uh, we're notice of rights, then we have notice of okay. activities, mm -hmm. under notice of activities. That should say student. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, and then you see the contact information for Dr. Lyons that no, <laughs> no longer seems appropriate. Um, wow. With that Here's said, if you are, so I should stop person. talking to see if there's any I questions. Are, yeah. Any other any other <clears throat> questions or considerations? No. Okay. I think that was well done. So if you if you, um, I think we're ready. Okay. Um, As amended, maybe, right? Yes. Okay. So I am looking for a motion to approve policy ILBA as amended. So moved. And a second? Second. Okay. So a motion by Ms. Devlin, a second by Ms. Barrett. All in favor? Yes. 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 Any opposed? So that is unanimous. And we can move on to school committee policy EEAE -E bus safety. So this is a little bit confusing and, um, and Ms. Rothermick is going to help me with it. But basically, we have it on as a policy. We're actually going to bring transportation policy back to you at the next meeting because EEAE, -E, bus safety, and EEAE, -E, bus accidents, um, and my, my colleagues are laughing because we had a lot of fun with this. Um, there was a lot of repetition, and, and furthermore, a lot of ease. It's <laughs> a lot of ease and a lot of repetition. Um, it, it, it occurred to us that this is largely procedural. And so, our, our approach to this particular work was to say, let's look at where there's overlap. Maybe we can, can have one procedural reference and then attach it to transport to the policy um, I passed it on to the transportation department and Susan Susan and Marianne Fitzpatrick and I worked together on compiling what is now in your packet which is the version that takes the two um, what formerly were policies and pr provides you with one procedural reference that covers both um, safety and accidents that we would propose referencing as a part of policy to be brought back to you at our next meeting. How did I do? Perfect. Okay. I don't, I don't I'm having trouble finding it. We don't have it. I don't have it. Okay. Yeah, we have it. Okay. So but up, I like until the the <laughs> up until the point where you didn't know what I was talking right. about um, and none of you were going to interrupt me, here you go. Okay. Um, and given the fact that you haven't had a chance to review it, um, we would be bringing this back anyway. We're not looking for a vote tonight um, because we'll be we'll be proposing that instead this become um, so I, I I'm really that, messing this up. I think that sounds. I mean, I, I think the approach is yeah. sound. It actually sort of slightly reminds me of what we did a couple years ago with all the finance-related policies. Sure. Yes. These are all related to transportation, yeah. so let's kind of take a holistic yeah. approach yep. to it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm on board. Okay. Um, Not just because we're running like It's right hour. here. I was just so what I, what I would suggest um, yeah. to, to Eugene would be that perhaps <coughs> given that you haven't had a chance to see this, and we were working on it right up until the last minute, mm -hmm. um, is that we – provide it to the school committee um, and we, we we're going to bring transportation back we bring the whole thing back instead and we can put it in your next packet so that you have you have the concept now of how we took the other two what it is we, we would refer to it as EEA-1 because it would become procedural um, I have it here but given that it wasn't as part of the packet I would suggest that I withhold that and we can distribute it along with your next packet for you to review and it will be then connected to the transportation policy to which it will be um, referenced. Um, and in addition, we'll, we'll have more information about and more recommendations around the, um, the five days a week issue. Okay. Sound good? Great. Okay. Great. Thank you. 
Okay, so then that skips us right past B, which is school committee policy E E A E E. Yeah. Um, so now we are on mm -hmm. uh, new business E campus and, road master plan. And if it's okay with you, I'd like to say good night to my two colleagues here and let them oh. leave, if that's okay. Well, um, is this her? it's okay with them too, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they they want to stay. Well, um, <laughs> face did not look disappointed. Yeah, I think that we're uh, we're good. The the one piece around the school committee um, hmm. the bullying subcommittee, I know that uh, Ms. Cavanaugh can cover. Um, so you want to be here for the master plan? Yeah, I'm first, sorry. So. Here, I was trying to let you get away. No, one thing is, we, I, I feel like we've no, really that's largely next, talked anyway. about. Yeah. This is really oh, right. just about about appropriating the money. <laughs> right. Like I, we've sorry, largely talked about the that's master right. plan. Right. Yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. 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 So, yeah. I, I was actually wanting to you to be dismissed right at old business, and I put a check mark there. So okay. I meant for you to stay. Sorry. She's projecting I am, what might happen. She's in the trying to fast forward. She's going to talk like an auctioneer. Yeah. All right. All right. So apologize. Um, so we have already sort of gotten the flavor of, of what we're talking about, and um, you've identified the funding source. But whatever else you'd like to walk <coughs> us through, please feel free. Um, well, not so you know, not so much. So we have talked a lot about this. So basically, the advantage, obviously, of doing the study now is the traffic is happening now. The buses are happening now. Waiting until the summer, you know, July one, a new funding year you'd have to then still wait till the fall to, to, to do a study. Um, so there is money in the in the parking fee revolving account. So that's what I would propose that we would use to fund to do the study now to come up with a comprehensive plan that's available for town meeting for that, that capital article. Do you have to bid it out? We have to get three quotes. So I'll just say for any diehards that are watching, the reason why this is different than the last conversation related to special education is that this is a separate, this is a revolving account with, an, with um, a specific an allowable purpose as opposed to our general operating budget. So this isn't money that we could shift into. I just want to be clear that people don't think we're doing anything that Funny. doesn't support our special education students. That, that is um, correct. Yeah, so, yeah, good point. So yeah, but, uh, but so as long as that is noted, um, I just feel like this is a, an excellent suggestion because before we just piecemeal things and we have a lot of traffic needs with the changes to Hayden Row and with the addition of the Marathon School, all of those things, um, I think this is an excellent step forward so that we have a pathway and, and everyone is clear from the beginning where we're going to need to go. So um, I don't know if anybody else has questions or... All right, so I think I'm ready for a motion to approve $25,000 from the parking fees revolving account to fund the campus road master plan design. So moved. And a second? Second. Okay, all in favor? Yes. yes. Okay, so that was a, a motion by Ms. Kavanaugh, a second by Mr. Gaziano, and a unanimous support. So now you're welcome to leave if you like. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You Thank so you so much. much. I know this is late. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you both for being here. <laughs> So on to old business, school committee policy, EBC, safety and security. So this policy is back for um, second reading. You had we gave, you gave me some great feedback at the last meeting. In addition, we talked about um, some of the references to current uh, procedures that we did not want to call out. Um, so the red line is what we had agreed to, uh, or at least my notes of what we had agreed to um, at the last meeting. Um, and you asked that I bring it back with the changes made so that it was clear. It's just the language after the str uh, the lines yep. that have been struck out. Yeah. It talks to in these circumstances. So that somehow doesn't seem to make sense. She, she's actually right. Yeah. Yeah. It's oh, so we just need to entirely. take that yeah, whole just take out? It. Um, Diagrams will not be made public. <clears throat> except no, we've got to put part of it back in. Yeah, okay. we've got to put it back in everything from except in circumstances to the end of the red line, because they won't be made public except if we need to share it with an electrician who's doing work, and then that person would sign an agreement that the plan will not be shared and will be returned. So, John, the only part that comes out is the first part, the first phrase that's outlined, underlined. 
So, th so the school administrators will share diagrams only with emergency responders. It's technically, you leave, the, technically you leave the whole red line in. Why, yeah, why would we not? Yeah. Okay. I forget why we did that now, though. I don't know why we ever there took that one out. We, we I remember why we put those things, the other pieces yeah. in, because we said that <clears throat> we, we didn't want to be as specific as diagrams of school right. facility interiors. All of our safety and security procedures are not. So yeah. Do we... Can well, we take? Uh, I think the line's valuable the because, line. like, again, yeah. there are instances where we're going to have to share this information with contractors. Right. And so I think it's worth spelling out of the policy that we're going to take public, steps to make though. sure that, well, sharing it with a member of the public. Oh, okay. Correct. I would have to then um, defer asking you to vote on this tonight because I am not certain that this practice is in place. Uh, as we describe it, the recipient of the plan will sign an agreement that the plan will not be shared and and will be returned when the plan is no longer needed. We wouldn't actually, now that everything is electronic, right? I think when this was written, there was an actual plan that people mm. would take in their hand. And so maybe we um, want there to be an actual plan rather than that, electronic. That's what I'm wondering here, right? All right, so do we want to? Um I'd like to bring hear this back. Dr. Well, Dr. first, I'd like to be clear on what you wanted to say. I, I know you want me to look into: is this what we really do? Um, I think if it's if it's what we really do, I think the language you added in and then put the red line back. Yeah, I agree. Because it just outlines the procedure that the school would undertake in the event that they had to share it with somebody who's not normally privy to it. Right. So again, if you had an electrical contractor come in who needed any or all of these things. So just take the red, take yeah. the line So off. you're comfortable with that last <clears throat> sentence? That that's something that we could be realistically managing? In most of these cases, it would be Tim Person, or it might be, you know, there wouldn't be just the building, not just, it wouldn't be the building principal who would be sharing right. these kinds of plans, but we, we do have situations, for example, I can vividly recall when the alarm was being worked on at the middle school and they wanted access to the map, to the some of the plans, of course. Um, so I, I, I think that, and maybe that, maybe it does need to come back because I, I think that's a, I think it's a valid question. Like I can see a security, I can see the security reason for wanting to have that very tightly controlled. Right. As with everything with security that we deal with with schools, it's how do you balance the the security concerns with the logistical right. concerns and I don't I don't know and you sent everybody home yeah. so why don't we why don't, why don't we just table this and yeah. maybe ask Tim what his what we actually do yeah. feedback is based on what he I think so yes. for that last yeah. sentence Tim that makes sense. if we're taking it up anyway we might we might as we better make sure that we yes. have it yeah. but I'm also hearing that we now think that what we took <clears throat> out probably stays in probably Unless you've taken out the sentence after it, too, right? Right. 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 Yeah. So, well, what we added in was important. Okay. So we've at least. And this is, it'll time. be quick. Review. Mm -hmm. I, I, well, we, I'll ask him to also check in. He'll, he'll know, but also check in with, um, with the principals. Mm -hmm. Okay. Great. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> excuse me, now we are on to school committee policy IJOA field trip. This is a fun one. Um, so we took this up, I'm trying to find the dates, but we took it up initially and we, in, we were in discussion about international trips. And in looking at the international trips, we found that there were some things that really we, we needed to change. So you see the field, field, one, the field trip request form, um, I think, in, oh, the whole packet is in here, but sorry. Look at the uh, overnight program tra intent to travel form. Um, in that form, revised right, on the second page, mm -hmm. what we've added at your recommendation was the classroom teacher support of the missed school days. So what's been a challenge for the school committee um, is when a trip comes to your attention and and you know, you can tell obviously from the dates that there are, there's going to be missed time. <coughs> Um, it was difficult for you to make it to be able to support the trip without additional information. 
And so when we first took this up, you, you had said to me, well, it would be really good to hear from some of the other teachers of the, uh, that teach the children who are not, for whose content area the trip, the, an example is um, robotics, for example, just put that one out there. And so we felt that by including it right in the planning form, mm -hmm. so it's not coming for final approval, this is the initial intent that it has the supports of other teacher, the support of other teachers. So it would be intended to circulate. It might only be one teacher if it's an elementary trip. We typically don't have overnight. missed school trips overnight for el the elementary kids. The, it could be one teacher. It could be several teachers, right? So that's why we wrote it the way that we wrote it. Um, the other thing that happened that changed that came up through looking at this was that the potential to a conflict of interest for a teacher who is chaperoning. So if they're going on an international trip, they're going to be, they are going to be missing perhaps a day of work, but in addition to missing a day of work, they're being paid by the touring company a stipend of some sort. And in looking into it, it, it was clear that um, having a disclosure form attached to the form would, would be what would be required. It just says, it doesn't say that they cannot participate, just that they're disclosing mm -hmm. a potential conflict of interest. Um, and then furthermore, we <coughs> added right in the form so that we could track it. Um, right here. So on the first page requires initial approval by the school committee. You can see where we included the state ethics commission forms mm -hmm. and rate right where it says school trips where chaperone teachers expenses are paid we put an additional paragraph in there to help remind us that this is something that we should be looking for um, so it, it's right in the forms now teachers will be made aware of it but this is where the fun part comes in in sharing the policy that was about to be taken up it caught the attention of some of our teachers who um, particularly uh, are asking for trips around music and the arts, and for whom they felt that the policy was no longer current. So I was coming prepared for your recommendation on the components that we were going to be changing, and in addition there were some new ones that were brought to my attention just yesterday. So again, I'm going to ask that we bring this back. I want your feedback on the first pieces, however, to see if it's what you had intended and um, the, the two pieces that I just reviewed and then would recommend that I bring it back next time along with a red line version of what the teachers would like you to consider changing as it pertains to, for example, um, the MICA okay. festivals. There are times when kids go to sporting events that we don't require a field trip and there are some ca comparisons that both um, the art and music SMLs, so Craig and Colleen felt should not pertain to them. Okay. Fair so enough. feedback on the uh, the the, the uh, overnight travel intent form, if if you have that for me. I, I think the form looks great. That's the form looks great. Perfect. That's everything what we you were wanted. For. Yeah. We will not be sending the elementary children <laughs> on trips. <laughs> you can tell I'm tired. Overnight trips. Yeah. No, yeah. no overnight <laughs> trips for the elementary kids. <laughs> So I, I just want to know the form is in such a fun font, it is. right? And so I haven't seen any other form like this. Is it because it seems fun with all the travel and everything? This was or? this was developed by a. I mean, probably this was probably what like three or four years ago that this was developed by. Actually, it might have been longer. Was it might have been before you were here? Um, the a group of teachers and. Um, and a couple administrators who have led a lot of these trips. Is so that right? Here's the school committee. Yes. We're boring. And we and right, we use and Times New Roman and call it a day. And, and, look the the form, <laughs> and look at the form that follows right after. Right. What a drastic change. Yeah. Well, that's a state form for disclosure. <coughs> yeah, well, they're even more boring than we are. It okay. does show a certain level of seriousness. Oh, exactly. I think we included the, the <coughs> conflict of interest law as well, just for your light reading if you wanted to look at that. But I'm pleased with the changes. I, I think that it gives me, us, also an opportunity to share it well in advance of any international trips coming to your attention. If you recall, this first came up over the dilemma of, of who's making these decisions to send kids with every district having these discussions right around some of the decisions that are being made. So um, it's still very much a parental decision um, and we are working with tour companies 
but this is just provides an additional layer of um, I think it's great that you have the disclosure form attached. Okay. Thank you. Good. That makes it very easy. Then I'll, I, as, I'm sorry to be bringing these back again, but it okay. did seem like there was more information that we should bring to your attention. All right. So now that's, that's that for that one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so now we are on policy JICSB. So this is our bullying policy, and we are just looking at the makeup of the committee. Which Correct. We got handed to us. Yes. Right. So. so so Dr. Cavanaugh and I together broke up the work here that she went and worked with Karen Renault, who's the um, sub wellness subject matter leader. And came, they came up with the specific people that you'll see with, that work within the school department. And then I had worked with um, some of the parent community, the Hopkins and Diversity and Cultural Alliance group and the CPAC and the HPTA that we had talked about. <laughs> as well as Denise Hildreth. The one name that I do not have a specific name for is the high school student. Mm -hmm. You'll notice at the end it will be one student, and uh, Mr. Bishop is working on securing that student um, specifically. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. Is that? Yep, yep. Excellent. Just so, um, so that this is, the, you'll also notice that some of the areas that we had talked about in parent representation because of the size of this committee, we we you'll notice like the HPTA person also is represented as an elementary school parent and so on and so forth so, so and, we and doubled up where we could we doubled up where we could just to keep it a manageable working yeah. size and who do we have from the middle school <coughs> so um, in terms of parent or in terms of working like staff staff wise we have uh, an adjustment counselor from the middle school and uh, Dawn Ronan, I believe, has a middle school, and, and as do I. So does Amanda Robichaud. Okay. And so, okay, but she also has an elementary. Yeah, I didn't. You're right. Okay, I missed that piece. Okay, thank you, Nancy. I think this is also nice in that okay. there's some there uh, there's some overlap from the original committee too, so that's really helpful in terms of just historical perspective. So that's that's great. And these were people that specifically also had an interest in working Absolutely. on this committee, which I think is. All right, so do we just need um, a motion to approve the makeup of the subcommittee to review the district's bullying prevention and intervention policy? So moved. And a second? Second. Okay, that was a motion by Ms. Devlin, a second by Ms. Barrett, and all in favor. Oh. I, I don't want to, I, I hate asking a semantic question at this time, <coughs> tonight, but are we approving the makeup or are we appointing the subcommittee? Yes, that's right. We are appointing the yeah. subcommittee. My, my bad. Okay. That's what I just, I read the um, consideration and not the motion. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> the value of my contribution drops dramatically. No, the motion says the same thing. Oh. Yeah. So all right, I we just, are going yeah. to appoint the subcommittee on district bullying prevention and intervention policy as presented so moved okay um and a second i'll second this one okay so that was a motion by miss barrett a second by miss devlin and all in favor yes. Yes. yes yes okay thank you john for catching that okay so moving on moving right along to uh old business d um, so, again, Ms. Kavanaugh, if you'd like to walk us through, you've made the final selections um, for our superintendent screening committee. So this actually, Mina and I had worked together on this, and this actually was really exciting. We had very strong interest. We had 13 applicants. We had very strong applicants. It, really, any one of them would have served very well with this committee, but of course that would make the entire committee too big. So we <laughs> looked at when we were trying to narrow it down, we tried to make sure that we were covering the charge of making sure that we had elementary and secondary in the community covered well, um, but also looking at people who were able to bring different experiences so that we didn't have all, you know, all the business people or all the school people or whatnot in there. So I, I, we worked, interviewed all over four days. That's right. All 13 of them over four days. Well, Very impressed with them, and I hope that uh, we can use some of that enthusiasm moving forward for that. We obviously need a lot more public input into this process, but I think it's off to a great start. 
So I don't know, do we want to read these for, or do we want to just? I think we can do it as presented okay. like we did. That's good. Or did we, did you read the last one? I did not okay. read the last one, but we'll, I was thinking because we'll they're not in the packet. Stay consistent. consistent. Yeah. Yes. Um, so <coughs> the one thing, so first of all, and just in terms of, well, two things. <coughs> one is, um, <coughs> I think just in terms of consistency from the process that we have engaged in in the past, um, typically the chair has been one of the school committee members. So unless you would like to do that, Jen, I would be happy to take on the role of the chair of the screening committee. I would support you fully in that okay. way. Um, so uh, that would, uh, that's the only change. I don't know that we necessarily have to vote on that per se, but um, that's just a change from what was presented. Um, so I think I'm looking for a motion to approve, to appoint the superintendent screening committee as presented. Um, and a second. Second. Okay, so that's a motion by Mr. Graziano, a second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. yes. Okay, and then um, I just wanted to say, <coughs> in addition to thank you, because I know that was a huge investment of time. It was, but it was exciting. It, it was really it's nice to see to so have. much it in so much enthusiasm for people for our district and wanting to really yeah. be part of this it's, process. It's a great. Last three or four of these we've done, we've been overwhelmed with applicants for the screening committee, the turf committee, Absolutely. the ESBC. Great. It's been really, it's That's been great. Good. It's been enjoyable. And it was just so wonderful just speaking to all the applicants and they are all so accomplished. Yes. And they care and they stepped up. Uh, that was amazing. And each and every one of them was sad that Dr. McLeod is leaving. So I, I do want to share that. And we're very, very thankful to all the applicants. They also invested so much of their time and energy filling out the applications, figuring out what works, and showing up and, uh, you know, being patient with our questions. Well, so it was quite an experience. So just in terms of both closing <coughs> the loop and capturing that enthusiasm and engagement, um, could I ask you or, or the two of you to work together just to follow, to just you know, close the loop with them and let everyone know who was and wasn't selected, how grateful we are for the interest, but also um, to really make it clear what the other opportunities are for public engagement, so the public forums that we'll have with the finalists, and um, there may be a need as we get closer to um, to the site visit to draw in some people from the community for that as well. So um, it's always hard to say no to people who are volunteering their yes. time, but I mean, it sounded like a tremendous pool of people, and I, I know that we'll be in very good hands. So I thank you both for taking that project on. It was a pleasure, but it was not an easy decision no, coming it up. Was not. Uh, and you we know, didn't like, always agree right away. Right, either, and we, we did not. We had, you know, we had different choices, uh, but we finally, you know, looked at the makeup of the committee as it stands right now and looked at how best the others could uh, pull their weight in. Um, and Nancy did in every single session she did share those other opportunities Great. and we do have plans to send those mails out Excellent. thank you Jean. well thank you both very much um so this is our second opportunity for public comment but there is <laughs> nobody here in the audience so i'm going to assume that we can move right along to items by consensus <laughs> and i am going to point out that we are now only two minutes late which i never thought we were going to recover i was so feeling the pressure way i to was go. feeling the pressure <laughs> <laughs> No ice cream, though. Okay, so okay. no. Yes, <laughs> Dr. McLeod. Superintendent recommends the school committee move to approve the items by consensus as outlined below. So moved. Second. Second. Um, so motion by Mr. Graziano, second by Ms. Devlin. All in favor? Yes. 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 Okay, so that is unanimous. And we are now at the point of adjournment, so it is 10 19. Um, I'd like a motion to adjourn. So moved. And a second? Second. A motion by Ms. Cavanaugh, a second by Mr. Graziano. All in favor? Yes. 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 So with that, I will wish any and all who are celebrating a happy Diwali, and we will see you back here on November 2nd for our regular meeting. Thank you very much to HK.